welcome to, uh, to our colloquium. Um, the, uh, the purpose of uh, this colloquium is to uh, really start thinking in maybe possibly new ways uh, of, our, of uh, modern army. Uh, at least add some dimensions which we have not seen. And to bring together two uh, things, that is, what we understand Armenian history to consist of, and how it's structured, uh, and see if international relations theory and practice uh, have uh, any relevance to our perception of that uh, story. Modern Armenian history, we usually teach it uh, beginning with the Treaty of San Stefano, February 1878, when the uh, Armenian Patriarch of Istanbul appealed to the Russian, victorious Russian general in, in the war against the Ottomans to, uh, to see if there could be something in, in the treaty that uh, would compel the Ottoman government to bring reforms to the eastern provinces of the empire, meaning what we call Western Armenia. Uh, if, uh, and this might have been a major, the, the major start of, of an initiative to bring in others to help Armenia. And uh, I'll talk in more detail when my turn comes. Uh, but if we look at uh, the history since then, uh, it's very difficult to tell Armenian history uh, without bringing in uh, everyone else. Uh, some women invited and some self invited. Um, <laughs> so the question is though, we're we're always looking at these things from very conventional points of view, and mainly uh, benefiting from the presence of one of our postdoctoral fellows, Armand Midori, who did a whole dissertation on the idea of third party intervention, applying it to uh, Kosovo, Yugoslavia, Kosovo, uh, uh, Rwanda, and Garapa. So, uh, and looking at Armenian events or related events from a theoretical perspective, uh, we start seeing some things which we would not otherwise. Some of these interventions are humanitarian. <clears throat> Others are uh, mediations, but uh, the presence obviously of, of the other in Armenian history is, is a tremendous, uh, it's a very important dimension. So what, uh, at least I hope we can accomplish to this, to begin thinking about these issues. Uh, because the way we structure modern Armenian history is way too fragmented. It's a, to me, it has been extremely uh, unsatisfactory. We hardly explain things, we describe a lot of things. We're not that analytical. And we're always stuck by dates that come in, and each one from a different corner. And we uh, we have not, in my view, developed yet that narrative that brings up. Maybe there's no sense. Maybe we can't find it, but I think this is an opportunity to start thinking about this. And but for that purpose, we have uh, uh, we see the panelists. I'll, uh, very quickly, Michael Reynolds, uh, Princeton University, Near Eastern Studies, Near Eastern History, and uh, an old friend for many years now. And he studied, if I'm not mistaken, in his dissertation, the Eastern provinces, the Kurdish issues, as it relates to the Russian, the, the, um, the Kurds in Russian policy and Russians in Kurdish history. So this is very close to our area, and we're very happy to have him here. Uh, Armand Grigorian, uh, who I mentioned, did a 
dissertation on third party intervention. He's a Onugian Simon Foundation <coughs> postdoctoral fellow with us. Next year he will be at Lehigh University. Uh, to my right, Antranik Migranian, who is quite well known in yesterday when, uh, when I introduced him to Michael Fox, who is the chief expert of the U.S. Helsinki Commission in Washington. And I tried to explain, and Michael said, I know who he is. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure whether that was uh, friendly or not. <laughs> but uh, uh, Antranik has been a analyst, a commentator, a political scientist, a theoretician. Uh, on the one hand, our of Soviet, post-Soviet space and problems, uh, but on, on, uh, on the other hand, he has also been a very active participant, uh, never having a position in government, but always being a, a behind-the-scenes advisor to uh, many presidents and ministers in, in more than one country. Um, I have formal affiliation with President Yeltsin and Right. <laughs> so uh, he was on the Council of Advisors for, uh, to President Yeltsin. And currently, he is the director of the Institute for Democracy and Cooperation. Uh, which is a Russian institute in uh, the main, uh, main important branch in New York. So it's currently in, uh, in New York. And then we have, uh, uh, and he's been on a lot of programs, from uh, CNN to Russian programs, and uh, write articles, and uh, op-eds, uh, analytical pieces. So uh, he is quite, uh, both an observer and participant in the recent last 20, 25 years. And Ron Sweeney, our own uh, professor of uh, history, who was the uh, first, some of you may not know, the one the chair was established here for our history, it began with him. And it took a lot of his time to convince Mr. Ron to start a chair. That was 1981. And he was here for many years. He was the first director of the Army Studies Program. Subsequently, uh, Chicago uh, stole him. He was there nine, ten years, and he returned. Uh, so that gave me the opportunity to stay <laughs> in <him. laughs> um, And he's currently also the director of the Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies here on campus affiliated with the history department. Do what I propose to do. Yeah, I think having in mind uh, that Georgia became such an important factor in, in this country's history, you must mention that he is the only one who knows Georgian language and wrote the history of Georgia. <laughs> yeah, he wrote the history of Georgia, which made the Georgians very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I've made all three republics very right. happy. Uh, uh, which which is enough to give him the best time. <laughs> when, um, okay, what I propose we do is, uh, uh, we start with Arman, uh, discussing the theoretical and practical implications of uh, the concept of third party inter uh, intervention. And then we we'll move to Michael, uh, 20 minutes each. Uh, and then we'll see, maybe we'll take some short questions, and then uh, I will give you uh, 20 minutes, and then I'm trying to do it, and then Ron will do the comments. So we will uh, try and get with a short break of questions, the five presentations in, and then we'll have a discussion, questions to each other and with you, and uh, hopefully by one o'clock, more confused than we are now, mm -hmm. uh, which is which I would consider a great advance. But at a higher level. At a higher level. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll we'll try to keep to 20 minutes, and, uh, but we'll have plenty of time to discuss and uh, add things later. Arma? Thank you, Shri. Uh, it is indeed a very interesting, very important topic especially in the context of our international relations. And although everybody 
kind of intuitively knows how important third parties have been in these relations. I don't think other than the Dominant Boxing Group, uh, there has been much of a systematic effort. Now there are general deals with the Dominant too, but Dominant Boxing is probably the only person who has systematically dealt with it in his work. And he was a historian, but we also need to be conscious of the theoretical underpinnings of what it means to talk about the third part of interventions, what kind of consequences they are supposed to have, what kind of mechanisms are involved when we have this theory, these theories purport to explain those consequences. What I'm going to do is organize my comments in three uh, basic uh, sections. And I'll try to be as brief as possible, uh, which means also that I'll leave out a lot of things that might be fitting. The first, in the first part, I want to present what the grand narratives are that are in existence today about the role of third parties. In the second part of my comments, I'll give you sort of what, for lack of a better word, uh, the state of the art is in political science and international relations theory about the consequences of third party interventions. And finally, I'll make some comments relating to those theoretical arguments to some of the important penitentiary claims regarding the Armenian-Turkish relations going back to uh, the mid-19th century when the role of third parties became relevant for those relations. So what are the narratives? Well, one grand and perhaps the best known narrative is that actually third parties played no role, and that's what they are uh, usually blamed for. Uh, the third parties were indifferent. Uh, it was a sin of omission that usually is ascribed to third parties. Perhaps the best known treatment of this narrative is in Samantha Power's acclaimed book, um, the, what was it called? Uh, remember? The Problem from Hell. Yeah. The Problem from Hell. And uh, she, dedicated, she dedicated a good chunk of, of her study to the Armenian genocide and how third parties essentially uh, didn't do anything. There is, a re <laughs> there is a recent book by a much better scholar, Gary Bass, called The Freedom's Fight. I highly recommend it. And uh, I think Bass also is close to this, to this narrative. That in the case of the Armenians, there was not much of, of an intervention. Uh, and this is, as you probably well know, is shared. It's the dominant narrative among Armenians that third parties didn't do squat when Armenians were being murdered, and that's why they were killed. This is also consistent with the, uh, with the current human rights discourse, where third party indifference or third party inaction is considered the most important permissive cause of violence against minorities. And you probably know a lot of. Uh, reports and studies to that effect dealing with the one against uh, the most recent case. The second narrative, which is not quite as uh, coherent and simple or as dominant, as well known as the first narrative, is that um, the third parties actually made things worse. They exacerbated the Armenian Turkish conflict, everything was fine, and then these damn Europeans came and messed it up. As you can easily guess, this is mostly consistent with the official Turkish historiography and the, and the official Turkish um, uh, logic and interpretation <coughs> of, of those events. Now, I'm going to tell you that it is possible to have a view of third parties having exacerbated the Armenian-Turkish relations without necessarily agreeing with the Turkish narrative, one of the most important elements of which is that everything was fine and that the Europeans came and exacerbated. I think everything was not fine. Things were absolutely terrible. Uh, however, I I think it is difficult to look at the historical record and not to conclude that the third party intervention, or rather interference, 
um, punctuated by cases of intervention, uh, did not did not really harm the army turkish relations, particularly following the Treaty of San Stefano, the Congress of Berlin, and the official um, emergence of the so-called Armenian question as, uh, as an item for the European great power defense. OK, so this is as far as the na different narratives are concerned. What is the theoretical debate currently in international relations about third-party interventions. Uh, there are probably many theories, but to me, uh, in my view, they can be all grouped in three basic schools of thought. The most dominant, again, and uh, probably the one that reflects the conventional wisdom is the human rights perspective. I have a hard time calling it a theory, actually, in standard academic terms, but it does have a certain causal logic, certain cause and effect um, arguments and uh, certain claim to explain uh, evidence. So it is not too outlandish to think of it as a theory. What is the essence of this thing? The idea is that uh, third party in action is typically a, an important permissive cause of violence against minorities and human rights violations in general. And there is a monotonic relationship between the degree of violence against minorities and the extent of third party involvement. By monotonic, I mean the more third party involvement you have, the less violence there is. And you know, it's like that. It's not, it's not pretty neat. Now, uh, there is an important and underappreciated element in much of the human rights discourse about this, which is uh, they argue that motives of interveners largely don't matter, although although the whole discourse is uh, branded as humanitarian intervention. But when you push some of the proponents of this school um, on evidence, uh, they argue that, well, look, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what the motives of the third parties are. Uh, usually there is a mixture of motives. As long as they get involved and help minorities, there is no reason to believe that it would not help minorities. And the common logic is pretty actually straightforward and uh, intellectually charming. Uh, the, 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 the committing violence against minorities is costly. And the more costly you make, and interventions usually make it costly, the weaker the incentives of the perpetrators are to continue on with such policies. The second very, uh, very popular, and <coughs> has become recently very popular uh, argument, and this is more popular among academics, is the moral hazard school, which says, even with the best motives and intentions, when third parties get involved, or when you have this established norm of the international community interfering intervening to help minorities, you generate a moral hazard in the same way buying insurance generates a moral hazard. So the same minorities, uh, or the minorities that otherwise would be fine and otherwise would not challenge state authority, right? knowing that they will now have help from the international community, acquire perverse incentives to cause the very violence that this norm with the threat of third party intervention, humanitarian intervention, was designed to protect them from. Uh, and in this case, the assumption is that the motives are indeed humanitarian, or at least the argument is that even if the motives are completely pure and humanitarian, uh, there will be moral hazard of this sort. I have to tell you that uh, even though it, it, is some, it, it is the sort of an argument that political scientists like a lot because it has this counterintuitive feel to it. Uh, it is also an argument that has been applied in other areas quite successfully, so it's likely to work in this case as well. Uh, this argument leaves a lot to be desired uh, because uh, I doubt that there is a serious humanitarian norm that they uh, kind of assume it exists. Uh, moreover, I think. Uh, if it is uh, the humanitarian norm is that, that is at stake, if they're not interested necessarily in 
third parties are not necessarily interested in supporting certain minorities against certain states, right? Uh, it would be very easy for the international community to say, we will come and protect you only if you are victimized, if you don't cause it, right? Mm -hmm. And we will never support you, certain political aspirations that you have, uh, which is like the equivalent of a deductible initiative. Yeah, but when you actually uh, do things like uh, implicitly promising dependence for Kosovo, right, this has very little to do with humanitarian motives. Moreover, uh, as I've argued in my dissertation, but I'm not going to talk about it now, uh, the, the escalation of violence in Kosovo was caused by the intervention, uh, not the other way around. The third logic, uh, which I have uh, been working on for the last few years, is the exploitation logic. And in this case, third parties get involved mainly because they, not, be, not because of the concerns for the minority, but because of their specific problems with the target state, which implies that the motives are not typically humanitarian, and the motives have to do with uh, the conflicts with the target state, and that it can <coughs> indeed exacerbate problems. It can indeed lead to escalation of violence through a set of mechanisms. Now, the main puzzle in all of these uh, debates is that you, know, you get simultaneous radicalization sometimes of both the state and the minority. And the way I solve this puzzle is to focus attention on the uncertainty regarding the third party's actions and the sequential, na sequential nature of this interaction. So it is possible for the minority and the state at some stage, at t equals 1, to believe that there will be intervention, and for the minority to radicalize. At t equals 2, there is information, or there are events demonstrating that third parties are not very uh, inclined to intervening, and the state may radicalize, or the state may radicalize um, uh, by way of preempting the third party intervention. The state may radicalize uh, because of several instances of intervention, and um, you know it may cut a deal with the third party and actually turn on the minority to deter it from future rebellion or future action, which then would provide the third party. Now, it's it's a really complicated and long set of arg arguments and, and causal mechanisms. Uh, I, I don't think we have time for that. Now, but what I want to uh, talk about next is uh, the, the sort of things that affect the simultaneous radicalization. Uh, and I want to break it down to uh, the minority's perspective and the target state's perspective. Um, one thing that will affect the minority's calculus as to whether to rebel or not um, is how bad the situation is. So even if you assume that your rebellion is going to have bad consequences, uh, those bad consequences have to be compared to how bad the situation is now. And uh, you know, if you think about it in the Armenian case, you look at the state of the Armenians in the mid-19th century or the, the second half of the 19th century, the situation is pretty desperate, pretty bad. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say a few more, a few words about why exactly that was and what had made the situation particularly bad in the second half of the 19th century. But it is undeniable that the Armenian situation was pretty desperate uh, in the second half of the 19th century. So there wasn't, you know, in the, at least ex ante, there wasn't much of a difference in the minds of the revolutionaries, at least, uh, between what was happening already and what could possibly happen. Uh, the second variable that may affect uh, the minority's actions is obviously uh, is almost trivial how likely success is, how likely they are to succeed. And you have to make a rationalist case for it, right? because any crazy person can think that they'll win the lottery tomorrow and become a millionaire. You know, that doesn't make the belief rational. Uh, whether in the case of the Armenians that belief was rational, there is you know, some, some things to be said about that, and I'll come back to it. And then the third variable is how insulated the elites are from the consequences of insurgency. And this has also been uh, subject to a lot of controversy and a lot of important 
debate as to whether the Armenian Revolutionary parties did things that ended up harming the population at large, but they themselves were not, uh, were, were fairly insulated from uh, the consequences of their actions. And again, this is not just for the Armenian case, it is a common argument for a lot of revolutionary movements, for a lot of nationalist movements, and, you know, for a lot of theories in international, in, in uh, political science about uh, differences in elites and mass preferences. What affects the severity of the response of the state? First, uh, how much is at stake? I mean, you, there, is, there is a tendency to think that states sometimes go after minorities because they're bad states and because you know, they like doing it. They're, they're just, they have the, the screwed up preferences, certain bad ideas of organic and ethnic nationalism. They seek ethnic purity and whatnot. Uh, if you look at the serious historical research, that is never the case. Uh, even the worst per perpetrators usually do this sort of uh, this sort of thing reluctantly. They'd rather not do. Persecution is costly, and uh, you know uh, states usually resort to it when they have to. States would be much happier if minorities were planned and they were doing whatever they wanted and they were politically under control. So, you know, killing is not fun, even for the worst perpetrators. That's a myth. Uh, how much was it safe in the case of Turkey? Again, that's a question we'll come back to. Uh, how likely is the perpetrator to be punished, exposed? If you do a massacre, what are the consequences? So this is also important. Uh, and also, how sure are you that the minority, uh, sorry, the third party involvement is really about the minority's issues rather than the minorities being, uh, minority being um, uh, exploited for, for certain gain? Now, it's, it's, a, it's a subtle argument, and, and you have to think about this. Uh, it's, a, this is important because if you're the target state and you think, okay, I'll do the reforms. I'll do the reforms and I'll take the measures that is demanded <coughs> by the third party, and then it will be over. That's what they demand, right? Because that's what they're concerned with. The welfare of the Armenians is what the Russians and the British are, and the French are concerned about. So once I do the reforms, we're home free. If you think that the reforms are a pretext, and you do these reforms, and there are going to be more reforms demanded, and more discontent, because it's really not about it you're going to have a completely different set of preferences and strategies. Uh, this is also true for um, cases like the Georgian response to Abkhaz position events, uh, whether or not you know, uh, the Abkhaz would be content, the Ossetians would be content with the confederal Georgia, or whether it was just a stepping stone for something else. So the, the, and, and uh, this was related, obviously, to Russia's motives. Uh, so again, this is very important the motives of the Now let's, I'm going to spend only two minutes, which is as much as I have. Uh, I'm really impressed that I made, made it so I do that. Uh, so uh, how, how, how can we apply these theoretical debates and whether they are relevant to the Armenian Turkish case? Now, one important observation is that indeed both sides radicalized with the involvement of the third parties and particularly following the great power, uh, you know, close great power involvement after the Congress of Berlin and the demand for all the reform, etc. Uh, the, the two sides radicalized because uh, of a number of factors. Uh, well, first of all, the Armenian situation, as I said, was pretty desperate. There were already rebellions. Say two, uh, in 1864, one every twenty years. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you, you have, it. yeah, you have this this scattered rebellious activity already, uh, a very high degree of discontent. The situation got exacerbated with the shrinking of the Ottoman Empire and the influx of Muslim refugees, <coughs> and the influx of Muslim refugees from Russia as well, who, by the way, have been not just the, the ones from the Caucasus, but also the ones from the Balkans have been one of the most important contributors to this antagonistic feeling 
toward the Armenians because uh, you know you can look at it from their perspective when they were being persecuted the same Europeans uh, had conveniently shut their eyes and they couldn't notice but these damn Armenians you know their nose bleeds and all of a sudden the whole uh, Europe is up in flames right we have to do something for all Armenians uh, so sociologically it's uh, kind of not impossible to understand uh, this hostility uh, however I should mention here that the state, by its policies, exacerbating it, by settling these populations exactly where Armenians were, they have other options. And uh, the state is now of the uh, Was there any reason for Armenians to believe that the rebellion and their tar party intervention, or the re there wasn't a rebellion, I mean, the, the resurgent and nationalist activity. Uh, eventually, if there would be a rebellion, could that lead to success? Could the third party support that? Now, retrospectively, it looks like a bad idea. It looks like an irrational belief for the Armenian revolutionary movements to have. But again, you have to look at it ex ante and for, uh, compare it with the information and the experience available at the time. And when you think about the very successful cases of Greek, Serbian, and Bulgarian insurrections in the third party, the third party rolling groups, including the British role in the Greek independence movement, right? You cannot really fault the Armenian revolutionaries with being irrational. Uh, it was perhaps a bad judgment, perhaps a bad decision, but again, it was not entirely irrational, and it has to be comp uh, compared with how bad the situation in Armenia was. Now, from the Turkish perspective, uh, by the time of the genocide, the Armenians had firmly become associated with this fifth column uh, minority idea. And uh, this was also rational, I believe, uh, for the Turkish case. But, but again, we have to be careful here whether this um, essentially uh, supports the Turkish narrative or not. I think it does not, in the sense that the Turkish narrative argues that everything was fine and they were our citizens and then they were disloyal. Then they cooperated with third parties. First of all, who cooperated? I mean, they, the, the Turkish historiography severely exaggerates the degree of actual Armenian cooperation, the degree of the popularity of the revolution <coughs> movement in Western Armenia. But the ones who cooperated uh, did so because their security and their safety in the Ottoman Empire was not guaranteed. They had to seek protection elsewhere, and that protection seemed available at the time. The notion that the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire should have felt some sense of loyalty and obligation to the Ottoman Empire to me sounds like a ridiculous notion. Now, I want to end with uh, a caveat. Um, <coughs> The caveat is that, you know, when, when, especially when political scientists study some variable, right, one important variable, they, they think it explains everything in cancer. Um, that everything else doesn't matter, and they have this tendency to think more causally and uh, to see the entire world through the prism of their argument. Uh, the question is whether third party, uh, third party's role was the only uh, or even the most important cause of the Armenian-Turkish troubles. Uh, I, I don't want to make that argument. There were probably a lot of other causes. I mentioned the influx of the uh, Muslim refugees, for example, and the decline of the Ottoman Empire in general, which usually is accompanied by forcing relations with minorities. So there are a lot of other things that mattered, uh, uh, and uh, the extent to which we think third party intervention is important has to be decided in the context of the other arguments and other variables. Unfortunately, I ran out of time and I can't talk much about the, or I can't say anything about the current state of uh, Armenian Turkey relations, but to we that. can come back to that later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Armas. Uh, we're okay. We have 20 minutes. I guess. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, John, <coughs> for starting us off today, and thank you, Gerard, for inviting me uh, to partake um, in this. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I don't have any, uh, I didn't have any pre-planned, pre-prepared remarks as I'm sitting now and trying to get them together because I wasn't exactly sure what we'd be speaking on. 
So I will perhaps uh, ramble for a bit, but we have uh, time for questions, so please, of course, uh, feel free to, to ask questions. This is a, is a great opportunity to, uh, to flesh out some things. Um, uh, let me, I guess, maybe start that I agree absolutely with Armin um, that the this issue of third party interventions um, exacerbated relations between, in a very bad way, uh, Turkish Armenian relations. Um, and that he's also absolutely correct, though, that this is not to say that uh, relations between Armenians and Turks prior to, if we take, um, which I think Gerard uh, started with the um, Treaty of San Stefano, 1878. That's when it's considered that modern Armenian history begins. I won't, for the sake of this discussion, I, I'm not an expert in Armenian history, so I wouldn't question it to begin with. But starting with that, um, Armin is exactly right. I think uh, that they, to assume that everything was fine before third party, third party intervention is, uh, is a huge mistake. But um, I do agree with him that it's absolutely critical uh, to understanding the course of Turkish-Armenian relations. And I think that uh, the works of people like Samantha Power are, mis are uh, very flawed in a very dangerous and bad way. Um, her approach to this. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Samantha yeah. Power, right. Um, third, third parties have tremendous power to do. Uh, it's easier for them to do a lot of bad than it is. Than it is uh, they have greater potential to do bad, to do harm than good. That, I don't want to. This is, we're not here to discuss how, how should third parties intervene, because at the same time, we wouldn't say third parties should never intervene. Um, right. Let me, um, maybe I guess the way to start out is, as Gerard mentioned, I, uh, in my dissertation, I did discuss uh, this issue of Kurdish and Armenian relations. Um, that's not the focus of the dissertation, and when I started my research, I had no idea I would be writing anything on this. I started out um, with the idea that I was going to write a dissertation on Ottoman Armenian, excuse me, Ottoman Russian relations uh, under from 1908 to 1918. That is from the time of the rise of the uh, community, a Committee of Union and Progress, often known as the Young Turks. Um, that's not a, a, a great uh, label for them. Um, but uh, so the rise of the CUP, 1908 to 1918. And I went off to the archives that I would do research in, uh, in Turkey, in the archives there, as well as in Russia. And I went off to them looking, had no idea what I might find, really, uh, and started flipping through the registers of the archives in the uh, Bashbakanlik Prime Ministerial Archives in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. These are sort of the main, uh, the largest uh, archival collection for the Ottoman history. And I was struck when I started coming across these mentions of Russians, and Russians uh, particularly, I remember the, one of the first things that really struck me is the uh, accounts of Russian officers dressed as Kurds running around in um, Eastern Anatolia. And I think, what's going on in these names, such as Abdur Razak, Sheikh Taha, you know, having meetings in, in Russian consulates and so forth. And I thought, okay, I'm going to find stuff on the, uh, the, the um, Black Sea Straits and that sort of thing. And yet, I keep finding all this stuff about Kurds going uh, in, back and forth in Russian <coughs> involvement. Uh, with Kurds now in Eastern Anatolia. And my thought also is I might see a lot about Russians and Armenians. Um, and then I discovered, well, as I started to look into this, uh, in the Ottoman side, it seems like, well, uh, the Russians are at least as active, if not even more so, they're active with Kurds uh, than they are uh, with Armenians. Later then, when I went to, uh, went to Russia and started working in the archives there, it uh, in fact turns out uh, that was very much the case, that is, uh, <coughs> Russians, there was tremendous interest uh, in the Russian Empire, in the role in place of Kurds in Eastern Anatolia, and the way that this was, uh, and their interrelations um, with Armenians. Um, the one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, I'll, I'll come back to uh, laying out some of the, uh, the social dynamics in Eastern Anatolia that <coughs> then um, created a crisis that, uh, <coughs> if I don't say demanded third party intervention, certainly uh, asked for it. Um, but before I say that, one point I wanted to make, uh, and I think this echoes some of the points that the Army was making, um, this is an extremely complex uh, period of history. Um, and this complexity, of course, we're historians, and historians love complexity, and they love nuance, as opposed um, uh, to political scientists. Um, we maybe love it a little too much, uh, so that we're uh, inclined more to describe rather than to explain. But in looking at the, the late Ottoman period, I, and one of the, the 
tremendous difficulties of writing on it is that you have this complexity. And the complexity derives from several factors. One is that you have multiple actors. So you have, when we, we're here to speak about Turkish-Armenian relations, well, we're already in third party intervention, so we're recognizing there are third parties. And those third parties isn't just the third party, let's say Russia, which is my main interest, but uh, Russia's very much concerned whether the British doing, whether the French, whether the Germans. They are all very much involved in this uh, as well. Um, but it goes beyond that. So right here you can say you get, we have Turks, Armenians, Russians, Germans, and French. That's already fairly complex. But it, it goes much beyond that because each of these actors is very much divided. It's very difficult to speak about. Um, I shouldn't say difficult, it's a huge mistake to speak about even the okay, Turks and Armenians. Um, <clears throat> it reminds you, it's the equivalent of asking, I think, someone to write the history of World War I speaking about the Europeans. Um, when you look at each of these actors, it was, again, what struck me was how divided they are. Uh, when we say Turks, you have the Ottoman state. Okay, oftentimes it's assumed Turk means the Ottoman state. But even the Ottoman state is very much divided uh, between itself. You have a, a the struggle for power going on throughout these years between uh, the Community of Union and Progress and its various rivals. Um, you have, in mean, looking at Armenians, okay, here certainly this must be, they must be united more or less. Again, you find tremendous uh, differences, uh, visions of the future, uh, ideas of uh, what uh, is the proper program uh, for Armenians. Uh, you have, of course, the division between Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and Armenians uh, in the Russian Empire. You have the Armenian Church, you have uh, the Revolutionary Parties, you have the Armenian uh, Peasantry, you have Armenian Merchants, all with very different uh, visions on, on what we should do, and um, each with a very different reading, perhaps, of, of the, what the future might be. Um, then, okay, let's say we have the Russian Empire. Now, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, everyone realizes it's in the stage, it's in its last years, it's struggling to reform itself, to hold together, it's very much confused. The Russian Empire, well, certainly here we must be, we have the Tsar at the top, and what he says goes. Well, of course, it's, 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 it's not like that at all. You find there, too, that you have different bureaucracies. The Russian Empire, it's a vast uh, entity, and you have uh, different bureaucracies doing different things. The diplomatic corps is doing what the military is doing. You have a uh, emerging civil society in Russia, which is beginning to uh, make its voice uh, heard. Uh, both in domestic and in uh, foreign policy. And then, of course, as always, you have personalities. Personality clashes, different agendas. So making sense even of Russian policy, one has to be very um, careful uh, in saying the Russians want to do X, Y, or Z, because oftentimes it's one uh, bureaucracy wanted to do X, another wanted it to do Y. And um, again, another thing that is uh, adding to this complexity, of course, is that no one knows what's going to happen. Um, there are wildly differing, uh, you know, wildly differing possibilities, or at least they're perceived to be wildly different. And uh, another actor, of course, that I didn't mention, one of the, the most complex and most important is uh, that of the Kurds. Um, and I say the Kurds as if this, again, we're speaking of a homogenous group. This is a group that um, everything that I've read seems to suggest is in terms of numbers, really the predominant population that's out there in Eastern Anatolia. Um, but when we speak of them as Kurds, that implies that they are all somehow united in this Kurdish identity, and um, they are very much uh, divided by uh, tribal affiliations. Um, uh, I guess you could also call them class affiliations. That is what the, uh, if I could say, the rank and file members of a tribe might uh, desire and what their uh, tribal leadership might wish for can be and often were uh, very different things. Uh, you have, um, of course, they're also Muslims, so there is a, a bond, not an overwhelmingly powerful bond, but there is some bond tying them uh, to Turks, to Circassians, another group that is out there. And uh, again, so it's another group of which it's very difficult to speak in, in, in general terms. So whenever I use these terms, Armenians want X, Y, or Kurds did this or that, uh, please uh, uh, bear that in mind that these are vague, uh, say vague, are generalizations and are uh, to be treated um, uh, with care. Um, I, maybe I'll uh, just say a few points that, you know, as Armin said, you know, this, the idea that third party interventions made everything worse in the uh, <coughs> Turkish-Armenian uh, relations and that they are to blame um, is a popular one among uh, a 
uh, has been a popular one among a lot of, a lot of Turkish scholars. And as Armin says, he loves to read kind of bleak. Everything was wonderful up until we, you know, we had this tolerant empire, um, the Milet system, the Armenians started to rule themselves, the Greeks were, were doing their thing, and over this presided the Sultan, and everyone got along. And then the great powers coming in, uh, driven by uh, imperialistic motives, started uh, creating problems. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, there is um, no, th th there were significant problems in Eastern Anatolia, and these are part of them. They stem from um, earlier patterns of, uh, of social and political interaction. That is essentially in, in, the, in the Armenian case that they are uh, living as what are. I think it's it's, it's fair it's sort of a. A subject, they're living as uh, subject non-Muslims under uh, a Muslim state, under and as a minority in terms of numbers, um, among a larger uh, our Muslim community. And they are regarded by their Muslim neighbors um, as inferior subjects. Now that's not to say that they were hated. Um, and here too, one has to be very, uh, again, describing the relations, I think, between uh, Armenians and Kurds and Armenians and Turks um, in you know lead up until uh, the late 19th century um, you, you will find uh, again some portrayals of these are relations where in it's a question of Muslim domination and exploitation of, of Christians um, it's not simply a story of that you also find other stories well in fact the two uh, got along so well that you find Armenians are speaking Kurdish um, Armenians and uh, Kurds and uh, my, my, the other uh, Christians and historians or Assyrian Christians also together with Kurds worshiping at the same sites, celebrating the same holidays, and one gets the impression that they are almost indistingu indistinguishable from each other. So it's clashes very strongly from this idea that there is this uh, major uh, divisions uh, between the two groups. Um, the, the truth is, I think, uh, between uh, these, these two things, that is, there is uh, a significant degree of tension, but to describe it as a as hatred or uh, pure and simple domination and exploitation is, is not correct. There was a um, maybe symbiosis might be a better way to describe the um, relations between Armenians and, and Kurds. Uh, Kurds being pre pre predominantly, although not exclusively, uh, nomadic, um, and the Armenians being a sedentary. Uh, people, and of course you look in other examples of history, that's uh, one of the oldest sort of uh, rivalries between settled peoples and nomadic peoples, yet at the same time you also look, they um, live in symbiosis together, that is each side produces something that the other needs, and so they can't, at the same time it's very difficult for them to live with each other perhaps, but they can't live without each other. Um, and so you, what you find changing, what's important to note is that in the 19th century, around the time of the Treaty of Berlin, and then things begin to accelerate, is that the social dynamics in Eastern Anatolia begin to change uh, considerably. Um, one of the main things is that this is a time when you have a, uh, to use the term now that's popular today, a globalizing economy. Um, Eastern Anatolia begins to experience um, economic growth. And as you have, part of this growth is driven by uh, globalizing markets, um, and part of it is, is um, driven by, you have more capital flowing into Eastern Anatolia, and this is the, the impact of uh, Europeans can be seen in this. And the, part of the group that is positioned to benefit uh, disproportionately from this are Armenians, for the reasons that they are, their literacy rates at, towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th uh, century begin to take off, um, to increase at rates vastly greater um, than those of uh, Kurds. I don't remember, I don't have the figures in front of me right now, but I believe that on the eve of World War I, literacy for Armenian boys was becoming almost universal. Uh, among Kurds, you have something perhaps maybe 5%, and literacy, this is not even clear, is this literacy in the Kurdish language, or is this literacy in Turkish, or perhaps um, Arabic. Um, <coughs> So you have uh, Armenians who are, and so you have Armenians who are predominantly peasants and living on the living on lands that are predominantly owned by 
uh, Kurdish tribal landowners are becoming more educated. And you have a growth of uh, quasi-industrial and merchant classes beginning to emerge in Eastern Anatolia. Now these aren't large places, it's only just beginning. And those are being filled by Armenians. One, because they're, they can do it, they're literate. And another factor assisting this is you have the, the, the impact of um, you know, Europeans. They are, because, in part because of their uh, Christian faith, are able to, or, or, and I should say, also are more willing uh, to reach out to the Europeans, um, to these uh, wealthier trade networks. So this is important from a Kurdish perspective. You have, on the one hand, from the tribal elite sees that the people living on their lands are becoming more powerful because they're more literate and they're becoming wealthier. Again, not all of them, the mass majority of, of peasants, Armenian peasants, are, in a, are, in, are not living under enviable uh, conditions. But they're beginning to understand there also are also alternatives to the way we're living. And perhaps we can expect that our children will be able uh, to live will be better off. And it's a, we are not condemned to live like we've been living for uh, forever. So from the, but from the Kurdish perspective, when they see, okay, the tribal elite might lose, they see a threat emerging from these people whom they regard as properly their inferiors. And then from the tribal rank and file, also see that they are being totally left behind. And this becomes more and more a, uh, a real, concern among Kurds is that they see where the world is going. And the Kurds aren't alone in this. This is a uh, phenomenon that you find throughout uh, the Muslim world, but it's, it's very much uh, among the Kurds that because we are not literate, because we're living as nomads, we're being left behind by the world, and we are going to be shut out um, in the future. And there's tremendous apprehension among them. Now we have, at, this, at the time when the CUP comes in, I will talk about the, we can if there are questions about the period before then, you have efforts at um, centralization that are uh, conducted by the Ottoman state as it tries to uh, reconfigure itself to resist the advance of uh, European powers. So you have, in the 19th century, um, efforts at centralization. One of the key efforts that they undertake then is uh, where prior up until the mid uh, 19th century, more or less, Eastern Anatolia was a backwater, and uh, affairs there were left to the tribal elites to, to run things more or less the, the way they wanted. You have, by the middle of the uh, 19th century, uh, the Ottoman state has destroyed these quasi independent Kurdish emirates to impose its own rule. However, the Ottoman state was too weak to actually, it succeeded in, in destroying these emirates, but was not able to replace them. Um, <clears throat> and establish um, uh, reliable state institutions. So you have a, a, a simmering sort of struggle for power going on throughout Eastern Anatolia. This is one reason why um, <clears throat> Abdul Sultan Abdul Hamid II then establishes his Kurdish regiments, the Hamidiye, which is one way to sort of win over uh, the Kurdish tribal elite back to the, uh, to the Sultan by permitting them to run, uh, to establish these military units in which they were given arms, were given some money, were given decorations, and were again given great latitude to more or less do what they wanted with the understanding that they would be loyal to the Sultan. Uh, when the uh, CUP uh, uh, enforces, uh, has this Young Turk Revolution 1908, brings back the Constitution, and they very much want to, and they do, uh, disband these units, um, that very much upsets the tribal leadership, which sees itself as that when they see this kind of emerging long-term threat, uh, threat may be, I don't mean portrayed in a violent sense, but rivalry uh, emerging or comp competition emerging from uh, the Armenians that they might be able to slip out from under the control. At the same time, they're, so they face this problem from below. Now they're also getting from above with the, as the Ottoman state in the beginning of the 20th century insists upon uh, asserting its authority and displacing the tribal elites as the main power brokers in Eastern Anatolia. That is now from the, the new Mike, power brokers. Yes. Hold it for a minute. Yes. Okay. Change. Change. I'm just going to change the table. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're done, but we'll take a few moments. Okay. okay. It's, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, 20 minutes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and action. Okay. <laughs> so as I was saying, the, the, you have the Kurdish tribe elite here is faced with a dilemma between two sides, and um, their option, the option that many of them took was to go over the border to Russia. Uh, Russia's interests, Russians began cooperating with this tribe elite and saw them as one of the key factors of influence in this, ter in this territory. Now, one of the things when I started my uh, research, my, again, the assumption was, well, here the, the lines basically as far as the Armenian issue is concerned, the Russians and the Armenians are allies. And maybe the Russians are uh, genuine in their sympathy for their uh, Christian uh, co-religionists. Um, maybe they're not, as a lot of the, 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 the Turks assert. Uh, the truth is, is, is far more uh, interesting um, than that. Um, I was again struck when, uh, working in, in the Russian archives, was looking at how much concern there was among the Russians about a about an Armenian uh, challenge to their rule, both inside their own caucuses, and then the fear that this was going to be it would spread to Eastern Anatolia, or that Eastern Anatolia would become a base for the subversion of the Russian Empire. Be that done by Armenians independently, or what really uh, frightened the Russians was the idea that the British, or the Germans, or the French they were concerned about all three, might be able to establish a presence in Eastern Anatolia, and from there be able to, to destabilize what uh, the foreign minister Sazonov, uh, Sazonov uh, called Russia's turbulent Caucasian uh, frontier. And in order to counter Armenian influence, they, one of the things they began, one of the reasons why they began to court uh, the Kurdish tribal elite was to counter uh, this Armenian, um, Armenian revolutionaries. To counter the Armenian threat would be to recruit uh, Kurds as a dominant element in Anatolia. That way, should Eastern Anatolia come under Russian rule, that they would then be able to uh, balance uh, the Armenians, always have the um, play essentially the Kurdish card against the Armenians. Um, the question is, I, can, I don't want to take up too much time, so I can go into more detail about the relationship between uh, the Russian state and uh, the Armenian revolutionary parties. Uh, far from being the tools of, of the Russian state, there was a great deal of suspicion, distrust, and hostility, uh, both from Armenian revolutionaries towards the, the Russian imperial state and from the Russian imperial authorities to the Armenian revolutionaries. And this extended to those operating in, in the Ottoman Empire um, as well. I mean, one of the things that struck me, um, it's known that the Russian imperial state had a great concern about, an exaggerated one, about uh, the possibility of pan-Islam and pan-Turkism um, coming from the Ottoman Empire into the Russian Empire. Despite even this exaggerated sense it had, my um, reading of the archives is that they were even, they devoted more resources to tracking the activities of Armenian revolutionaries. That they saw them as a greater uh, challenge to their, to the Russian state than the, this problem of, um, exaggerated problem of uh, pan-Islam and uh, pan-Turkism. Uh, um, Maybe, I mean, maybe, I don't know if I should, uh, there's a few more things I could say, but we can, I maybe should save them for let's, the... Let's keep it, you'll have a chance. Okay, one, I mean, one thing, another uh, key factor, I think, uh, on the, in the, that shapes Turkish and Armenian relations in a way that neither desired uh, nor, um, certainly uh, neither desired. This is the, 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 you have throughout the 19th century, um, as is well known, the uh, growing acceptance of the nation state um, as the proper form of statehood. That is, you have the growing acceptance of, throughout, I shouldn't say throughout the world, actually, first and foremost among European elites and the diplomats who are the ones who play such a great role in shaping uh, the rest of the non-European world. That is, you have this, the assimilation of the idea that humanity is naturally divided into nations um, and that each of those nations deserves a state. And the, this is enormously important for understanding the, the outcome of relations in Eastern Anatolia. That is, you have these power brokers at the top who uh, accept this idea, and it seems the most improper and just uh, system of rule for the world, but it's a, this idea of the nation state is very poorly suited for Eastern Anatolia, as it is for much of the rest of the world, um, because you have in, in Eastern Anatolia you have the Armenians are a major element of the population in Anatolia and the Caucasus, but in Anatolia are not 
um, except for some small places, are not the predominant element. And even where they are, you still have large numbers of uh, Muslims living alongside them, that you have intermixed uh, populations. So this idea that you should have uh, homogenous uh, nation states, the states tied to territory and ethnicity um, <coughs> tied to territory as well, simply does not fit um, in Eastern Anatolia well at all. So it's one of these questions, if we get rid of the Ottoman Empire, what is going to replace it? And one of the fears, of, certainly of the Muslims there, looking at what happened in, in the Balkans, and this applies uh, not simply to the Ottoman state, but also to the Kurds living on the ground there, is the idea, well, this territory is going to become in Armenia. It's going to be in a, become an Armenian state, and we are going to be living under Armenian rule. Um, and this uh, <coughs> is a source of great concern uh, to them. And it's, I mean, one of the questions I have is, is I would like to hope that some Armenian researchers will, will write on this more in detail, is what were the, what were Armenian perspectives of the future and what was their vision? I mean, the best I can tell, this is very vague, perhaps maybe for obvious reasons, because the most, uh, at this, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, the most appealing uh, model would be that of the nation state, yet looking at the realities on the ground in um, Eastern Anatolia, it simply cannot work. Um, or it cannot work unless you have, what did happen, mass uh, expulsion and annihilation killing of uh, population groups. Um, but because the way the diplomatic framework, and uh, Eric Weitz has, has written very, uh, uh, has written a, a wonderful art article on this topic of the way the, the international order, or I should even say we say international, because that buys into the assumption that the basic units of uh, world politics our nations, of how this began to shape uh, the population politics throughout the world, that is, interstate relations began to, to, to shape uh, politics at the ground level in ways that those people, those uh, the parties on the ground, may not have desired. That is, you don't have, this isn't the, you only have the, your options are limited by what the, uh, the powers at the top, the way that they are, uh, the way that they are, the framework that they have set up, if that uh, makes sense. And maybe I will, uh, I'll end there, because I can, I can keep going on, on and on, so I'll, I'll end there. Thanks, Michael. Um, maybe we'll just, just for a change of pace, see if we have a couple of short questions to the speakers so far. We'll have the larger discussion later, uh, before I give you my presentation. Any quick questions, uh, comments? I'll ask a question. I'm always ready to ask a question. Um, these two presentations work very, very well together. I mean, one from a sort of comparative theoretical perspective and one from a kind of very grounded, deeply textured, archivally based uh, account. Uh, and my question would be um, precisely about uh, the conflicting social constructions of different actors of the, in this environment. So let's limit the discussion, let's say, to the late 19th, early 20th century. Clearly there's a change in 1908 because of the Young Turk Revolution. But each of these different actors, and Michael disaggregated even the number of actors, so there's people within states and within uh, minority populations, has different ways of imagining where threats are coming from and what their possible futures are. That complicates the, the, the picture quite a bit. Um, and I, I just want to ask uh, a question about, uh, to, to each of you about how would you, how would you in fact imagine solutions? That is, we know what the end of the story is. The end of the story is the worst possible thing that can happen. That is, for both sides. One is the physical destruction of a million Armenians. And the other is the collapse of the empire. So both sides lose in a way, right? Um, so how, how would you, what would you say are these sort of uh, constructions of the enemy, threat, and future? Maybe that's too big a question. Maybe that is. <laughs> Let's leave that. <laughs> I, I have a more uh, simple question. Uh, 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 actually, I was uh, amazed now 
growing up in Russia, living in Russia for many, many years, I never understood the idea of Labanov Rostovsky's statement that the Russian is Armenia without Armenians. Right here, <laughs> right here I realized why Labanov Rostovsky could say that kind of thing. And when I met his grandson in one of the reception in consulate, he was so proud somebody brought his team to me and said, this is Count or Prince Labanov Rostovsky. I said, you know, all Armenians uh, have a very sad feeling concerning your <laughs> grandfather. <laughs> he said such a stupid thing. <laughs> but now I realize that it was not very stupid. He had a very serious logic. But I want By to the way, uh, a, a relative, a, a grandson of Labanov Rostovsky was the first person who ever taught Russian history at the University of Michigan. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Did you know getting Armenian close. students? Uh, I don't know about getting that. closer and closer. <laughs> yeah. Ed, I just wanted to ask another question. Uh, you know, you said that third party intervention is exacerbating uh, the situation. But if not intervention of third party, what's going to happen if without intervention? That too is a very complex question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short one, but so let's keep those. Yeah, and Sarah keep had a question. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. just use it later. Uh, okay, just think yeah. about it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me uh, make some comments um, that possibly build up on what has been already said by Armand and Michael. <coughs> First, is that I've always wanted to have, I've been teaching Armenian history since uh, 71. Now you're getting it right, huh, finally? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm getting more confused. <laughs> more confused. I mean, I, I've done it at Cal State LA when I was a PhD student, and since then. Um, and it's becoming more and more uh, confusing, and that I find it very healthy. Uh, but the big question is, how, how do you tell that story, as I mentioned earlier? There's so much dysfunctionalism and discontinuity. That is the way we tell the story. Sometimes we work with the domestic issues, the differences, the fights within the community, and then suddenly we are cussing the British for reneging on their this or that, and then mentioning, you know, uh, Russians who said this, and then we come back, and and in this confusion, what we usually end up with is uh, a sense of the complexity which makes us lose all perspective. And then we have now focused to, to make sense on, on uh, the victimization is the main line in Armenian history and genocide. Uh, the question that comes is, first of all, um, are Armenians actors in this story or are they just victims? Uh, sometimes we write as if we are just victims and genocide was inevitable. So you can write and everything you're going to write since uh, uh, the treaties, uh, San Stefano, Berlin, in, in terms of this interaction. And we're not even sure whether, when we're talking about third parties, uh, are they third parties or are they integral to our history, these great powers? Uh, is the Ottoman state integral to our history or is it a foreign power? And much of Armenian history is within that Ottoman Empire. And then on the east side, we suddenly have a republic, and then Soviet Republic. So there's, this is a big problem in terms of what role do we assign to these different actors. And of course, once we do, uh, we, we make genocide the central history, uh, then we also lose sight of the internal differences, class differences, political approach differences, and all. Uh, our discussions today on that period are less sophisticated than the discussions that took place in Istanbul in 1978, at the end of the Russo-Turkish War, within the National Assembly under the Patriarch, regarding third party intervention. That is, there was more sophisticated discussion there within the National Assembly as to whether the Patriarch should or should not go to the Russians to ask for help in reforms. Now there's all kinds of logic uh, on 
why Armenians went there. They had tried so many other things, and I would say that the situation with the Armenians, it wasn't just uh, a matter of the Muhajirs coming in, but also uh, an issue which I'd like to discuss with Michael when I ask him a question on this economic issue. Uh, most of the uh, material I know from Armenian sources is that economically things were getting much worse for the majority of Armenians. So maybe this is not in contradiction to what you're saying. There may have been a class that was developing in the right direction, but for the <coughs> most part, the rise of the Armenian political revolutionary parties is based on uh, the assumption uh, that things are getting so bad that Armenians are losing control of the ability, uh, are, are losing the ability to be a community because of the undermining of the agricultural policies, the Ziad Bam Kasser issues, uh, and, and uh, the lawlessness that was spreading. So there is a sense that everything is being lost. So, uh, as I said, it's not necessary that these be in conflict, but it's interesting to, to bring these two together. So, uh, but the Istanbul leadership is, is, is uh, quite conservative, and this is before the parties. And the Patriarch, when he wants to go to the Russians, there's a big debate. And there's a vote, and he wins his argument that he should go and ask for the Russians for help, and he gets Article 16 of the Treaty of San Stefano. The, uh, and the others are arguing that bringing in the Russians is a big mistake, bringing in others is a big mistake, because it's uh, particularly under those circumstances when the Russians <coughs> are fighting, the Russians are winning the war, and you are going to a third party to impose something on the defeated power that is your government. So. That assessment uh, was, uh, that strategy was questioned and was critiqued. And after that, when the San Stefano Treaty was replaced with the Treaty of Berlin, where the article was much vaguer and even more dangerous instead of just Russia, all the great powers were now responsible for reforms and all. And third party intervention, ostensibly humanitarian for reforms and all, becomes integral to Ottoman thinking as to what reforms mean. So uh, the historical debate has been even less sophisticated than what these people argued at the time. Um, it, we have to think very seriously as to Armenians becoming actors, first through the Patriarchate, which was the official body and institution, and then through the political parties uh, in, in terms of uh, what did they want? How? What did they envisage for the future? And how did they? What role did they assign the Western power, the Great Powers, and and uh, to in the relationship to internal reforms? The this period of San Stefano and, and the Treaty of Berlin are critical because the rise of the revolutionary parties is a reaction to this. That is the failure of. Uh, the failure to implement the reforms promised in, in the Treaty of Berlin <coughs> becomes a reason why the political parties are founded. It is essential. And in fact, the Hinchagyans, who are uh, the first big party to, to come up, and they dominate until our 1894, 96 massacres. The Tashnak tune that becomes the more dominant eventually, when you read the literature of the Tashnak tune, particularly, and the Hinchags in their early pages, there's a question as to what is the role of the Treaty of Berlin. That is, are they there to, to find more ways, better ways to force uh, reforms and therefore make the great powers put more pressure that they had, for, you know, they had forgotten the reforms and to become close to this moral hazard issue. What was the revolution about? Was it a means uh, to uh, by fighting for it, remind the great powers and force them to deal with this? Or was it really to have a revolution to change the system? And, and this was never made clear in the revolutionary parties. They wavered from self-defense all the way to creating a state, and, and all of that is extremely confusing, but when you read the party literature, the newspapers and articles and editorials, at the time it is very clear 
that there is that element, and they reminded the Chinyan Heilig uh, uh, sermon, uh, which said we went to Berlin to bring in reforms, and it was more like a harissa, and we were eating, everyone was using an iron ladle, and we went to pick up our soup, uh, our harissa, and ours was a paper. So, uh, and that became. And then when they wanted Khrimian to be part of the revolution, and the Chagans went to talk to him, they, Khrimian said, I don't want to have anything to do with this revolution. And the Chagans said, but it was your idea to, to, and he said, well, it was my idea, but my idea was not that you pick up a couple of chakmakers, a couple of old rifles, and fight the Ottoman state. That wasn't my idea of the iron labor. Now, what else could it have been without? But this is, uh, this is the, uh, the process where the political parties themselves are involved. And uh, in the third party, uh, that is integral to their thinking. And in fact, uh, the Turkish narrative and also others have accused the parties of having created bloodshed in order to attract attention. Uh, and that is part of it. And all of that becomes part of the Ottoman and Turkish and Young Turk narrative. And all of this is lost as to what do Armenians say or do, uh, however legitimate their concerns in terms of what happens uh, at the end. And this is also important because if you look at uh, what has happened in the last 40 years, what has been called by some as Haita, the Armenian cause, which has now been uh, simplified into uh, genocide recognition if you look at the structure of the political thinking, it is not that different from that time. That is, we want third parties to recognize the genocide. It's the same matrix, the same formula. It is not dealing with the Turkish government or Turkish society. It is dealing with the American Congress, the European Parliament, and it is still the same reaction from Turkey. The Ottoman Empire said it, the Turks have said it, don't put pressure on us from the outside. So there's a reflexive reaction there, whether justified or not, that's not the issue. But that's what we're dealing with. And you wonder what happens when you have not been successful in getting, at least through pressure from the top, to get the Turkish government to recognize the genocide. But then it doesn't matter anymore. It is not necessary, and in fact, it may be very detrimental to Armenian political culture to see Turkey recognize the genocide. Uh, what will then we be doing? This is very dangerous. And we are comfortable with this third party as an integral part of our thinking, because what we've done is now made uh, the third parties integral to our thinking and we want the identity. And we've made them uh, the necessary other, that other which obliterates the difference between the past and the present, obliterates the difference between generations, obliterates the difference between diaspora and Armenia, and creates this uh, homogenized thing called Armenian forever, everywhere, anytime that single Armenian, and within which, if genocide recognition is the big battle, which I will never win, I mean, if the Congress recognizes or whatever, as, as you know, Congress will not recognize it, doesn't matter what. Uh, but the battle is what counts. The battle is what makes any deviation from the uniformed uh, concept of genocide recognition as the ultimate and sole and absolute value that we must pursue. It's the battle that counts. We go there every year, we are defeated every year, and then we blame uh, this or that uh, every year, just as at the time, uh, during the reforms issue, Britain would promise and then would not, and then you could see in the revolutionary part of the literatures, the, uh, the perfidious Albion, and, and you see this and that. You know, all these guys with whom we now take pictures, and we used to, go and knock at their doors and happy to get coffee with them, uh, then suddenly they become traitors, they become immoral people, suddenly morality comes in. And it's this repetition 
And it's the repetition that is the substance of the whole thing. Uh, and, and this is a very different thing than third party intervention as we know it. Uh, and this is something that we really haven't looked at. Uh, I think we, we, uh, we're afraid, uh, at least in terms of the writings that we have. Um, particularly when uh, in the diaspora, uh, we are the third party. We are acting as Americans. We are acting as Russians. We are acting as Europeans when we demand that the European Parliament. It's European citizens who are acting. And we are the third party. And we are inter uh, asking for an intervention in, in a dispute where we are also the Armenian or the historical actor that was victimized. So this is totally confusing, but it is all very simple. With all the complexity, it's very simple. There are the others, and there's us. And the us is all the same. Uh, and that it makes it possible to, to simplify. So I, I look upon the third party uh, as, as, uh, as, as something that creates as many problems as, as it resolves in a different way. If you look at the historiography uh, on, on this issue, it is not treated in terms of IR theory. It is not treated in terms of even of historical terms. It is uh, almost psychological uh, and, and uh, uh, moral. Uh, that is, the world owes us something. So by that, we will decide whether you're the good guy or the bad guy. A congressman, uh, uh, if tomorrow Obama recognized as president of genocide, we will be completely disarmed. And he will be a saint. And there will be Obama squared again. Uh, <laughs> there will be. But at the same time, if Obama compels Garapal to be turned over to the Azerbaijan peace, we may forget it. Right? And this is a very important relationship because for decades, I can guarantee you, I've been always concerned when a president of a great power praises an army or praises Armenians. I knew they screwed something. <laughs> Somewhere they did something wrong, and that praise is covered up, uh, covers up what they did. And I always look as to what is it that they did somewhere else that we can't see. And uh, we have so many issues. Uh, so, um, I want uh, to go back on uh, to the moral hazard issue. Uh, we have not really dealt with that except by moralizing the discourse and, and uh, defining Armenians as victims, then it becomes very simple. Uh, and our role in, in, in all of that becomes quite secondary. Um, I think I want to stop here at the fundamentals of what I wanted to, to say. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a five minutes break. Uh, yeah, let's take a five minute break. Sure. It's uh, before we have 10 30. Before you give me the phone. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we will need a break. <laughs> we need to run right now. To continue. When I was a uh, senior advisor <laughs> to the committee, <laughs> I think I stopped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so please be careful. The Committee of Foreign Relations of Russian Parliament in 92-93, before Yeltsin uh, crushed Parliament and bombarded them by tanks, uh, usually we discussed every week and we had Russian Foreign Minister or his deputy, who is now uh, Russian Ambassador in New York to UN, Chukin. At that time, he served as deputy foreign minister. We were discussing the problems of Bosnia. And this was the hottest topic uh, for Russia, for Russian American, Russian Western relations. And I must tell you that third party intervention ended up with enormous activities of Richard Holbrook. Then it wrote to Dayton. 
and this was extremely favorable for one of the parties, at least uh, Bosniaks or Bosnian Muslims, they became the winner because of this very strong intervention on behalf of them against Serbs and partially against Croats, at least in that region. I'm not speaking about Kosovo, where our best friend, uh, Rosemary de Carlo, the wife of another, my very good friend, uh, Tom Graham, who was former uh, special assistant to President Bush, she, in a position of uh, deputy uh, assistant, deputy secretary of state, was in charge of Kosovo, and together with Kushner and others, practically brought independence to this territory uh, uh, in violation of every kind of international law. And this was because of political decisions of third party. And that's why Clinton has his uh, monument in uh, Pristina, which means not every, uh, which means you, you need to be a fortunate minority when your interests are coinciding with the interest of a strong third party who is very determined to uh, step in and solve the problem. It doesn't mean that he is solving your problem, but solving his own problem, he is doing enormous you know, favor to you. Unfortunately, as we realized here, none of these great uh, powers who intervened in Turkey never had their strategic interest coinciding with Armenian interests. Even Russians, and uh, Armen didn't mention Russian narratives because during the old Soviet period, in Armenian historical books, in Russian historical books, there were very popular the idea that Russian foreign policy goal in Caucasian region was uh, liberation of Armenia, Armenians uh, from Turkish yoke or dominance or all these kind of things. But in reality, even that was not the goal of Russia. Neither uh, uh, Brits or French or others that was a bad fortune of Armenia. And I think in this case, uh, the truth is might be in, in some other place where uh, I think Tony was closer to reality who said that two ethnic groups fight it for their statehood and nation state, and it happened to them that they were fighting for the same territory in Eastern Anatolia. And that in his uh, history of Ottoman Empire, the fall of Ottoman Empire, if I correctly remember the book which Tony wrote at the beginning of last century. And Armenians have to be the weaker part. They had two big ambitions. And, uh, and if not, a third party intervention, then the stronger is always right what he is doing, unfortunately, this is the case. And I think Kurds know that uh, now in their own experience, when you don't have. And another important thing, coming back to my question which I raised, what is happening, and should I mention that might be Armenians have to deal with Turks. And being a member of TARP Commission, I remember in Vienna and then in Geneva, our discussions with our Turkish partners, uh, very prominent Turkish diplomat, Kundos Oktan, he passed away recently, I think a couple of years ago, but he was a very prominent guy, and uh, columnist in radical newspaper and Turkish nationalist-oriented. Ilter Tukman, the former uh, foreign minister, and Sandberg, uh, the deputy foreign minister, very influential and very, uh, you know, a brilliant diplomat. They usually said, don't involve third party to make pressure on us. 
it better Turks come to the conclusion that they are not going to deny uh, the genocide and Turks themselves will recognize what happened and do something. After that, they said, you know, this was Mendoza's idea, but Turks don't have the idea of repentance. You must be sure that this is unfamiliar. This idea of repentance is unfamiliar with them, with Muslims. And second, they said, don't make a pressure. We are not used to make any concession under the pressure. But at the same time, they are not ready to do anything without pressure. That's why this is the problem. Whether you need to have third party or you don't. Of course, when you are a small country, three million population, 30,000 square kilometers, and vis-a-vis -vis you have a country about 75 million or something like that, and more than a million square kilometer, one of the strongest armies in the world, and you have ambitions, and the Armenian ambitions are to get back uh, territories, to, do, to get recognition of genocide, and to get reparations or some kind of material compensation, what happened? If no third party intervention, who is going to do anything? Uh, that's why, for me, at least, it's clear that without third party intervention, you can have anything. But this is, again, the bad luck of Armenia, that never Armenian interest coincide the real strategic interest of any great power. And now also, coming back to current situation, I must say that if not third party intervention, you never could have anything in Turkish-Armenian relation. Neither even third on the level of civil society representatives contact because no contacts ever been <coughs> except some contacts under Levon Del Petrosian, my good friend Felix Mamidonian started his contacts with Turkish diplomats in Moscow. These were informal contacts and you know that and in some other places also were some contacts. But no formal contacts because nobody dared to have this contact on Armenian side because there were some ideas about precondition. Turks also were distancing themselves because no contacts, no problems. You have this uh, Armenian Nazari problem. And Turks didn't want to link themselves with Armenians without solving some problems concerning Azeri. But because Americans really wanted at that time Turks and eight years, uh, 2001, 2002. My body, by the way, Turk is the Turkish Armenian Reconciliation Commission, which was not an intergovernmental commission, but done with the, the, point, with the, the knowledge and support initially of the Turkish and Armenian governments. And it had <coughs> Turkish and Armenian representatives, and Mira, uh, Mr. Miranda uh, was, was a member of that. And even at that time, the design of commission was very interesting, and I agree with Girard, who said that we are third party also, because there was a need to have a couple of representatives from Armenia itself, one representative from American diaspora, and one representative, as me, from Russian diaspora, the largest diaspora. And even there was an idea to have somebody from Europe or from Middle East, but we didn't find a uh, properly prepared uh, uh, somebody who could be a real part of them. Anyway, coming to the current situation, even this uh, current negotiations, protocols signed by Armenians and Turks, it would be practically impossible without mediation of great powers and formal mediation of Swiss uh, foreign minister. But of course, everybody knows that the driving force behind this was State Department. Washington is interested in solving these problems in a way pushing forward 
how is the breakthrough, how is the kind of solution of the problem between Turks and Armenia. In previous years, Russia was not happy and Russia didn't want any kind of solution on this issue. I think never articulated this openly, but never Russia was interested in this. Because you have this problem over there, you have total dependence of Armenia from Russia. And <coughs> Russia is presented in that region, which is very important region for Russia. And many times on Russian television and in my comments, I <coughs> compared this southern Caucasian region uh, and Caucasian region as a whole as a soft belly for Russia. This is the most vulnerable place for Russia. It is very vulnerable because many, many uh, factors uh, just it's vulnerable because Islamic world is there. It's vulnerable because uh, Americans are very interested through Turkey over there. Iran is there. And Islamic population in northern Caucasian region there, Turkey having access to uh, Black Sea from one side, then having an access to Caspian Sea, and Iranians having access to all these very sensitive areas for Russia. That's why Russia losing this area, Russia could lose the country at all. All the south Russia could lose, which, which could be, uh, I don't know, if Russia couldn't survive as a country because this was one of the hardest things which they did uh, under the Piotr the Great. Anyway, and the only food place in this region was Armenia where Russia was present. But something very important is changing now, which practically changed the Russia's position. And something is Turkey. Turkey is changing, and Turkey is becoming a new uh, real actor in international scene as an independent actor. It's becoming more and more independent. By the way, one of the reasons why Washington is pushing forward this process because Washington is becoming afraid that Turkey really is becoming more independent from Washington. Turkey is becoming more Islamic oriented. And if army could get rid of Erbakan, now Erdogan is becoming get rid of army, I think, which is one of the most serious and important problems. Turkey is not afraid of Russia. It's not a Soviet Union. Nobody is going to conquer Turkey or Straits. Turkey has a bigger and stronger fleet in Black Sea than Russia. Turkey's army is might be more efficient now than the Russian army, if not nuclear weapons uh, and capabilities. Conventional forces in Russia you know, <coughs> are now in a serious process of transformation and conventional forces. Turkey is the biggest and strongest might be in Europe, or might be except the China, might be Turkish army is the biggest and strongest army in sense of conventional. Turkey has fantastic now economic, commercial, technical, and military ties with Russia. Almost more than 30 billion trade turnover. Russian tourists outnumbered German and European in Turkish resorts. Turkish construction firms were very active, especially at the beginning of uh, Perestroika and New Russian period, and they were just, you know, flooded all central and southern part of Russia. Turkish capital very active. And Russia doesn't have any fear vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. That's why Russia now is more enthusiastic to have breakthrough in Turkish 
Armenian relations because Russia is not afraid to lose Armenia because of this, but Russia has additional access to Armenia through Turkey now even. And uh, Turkey is becoming an interesting element as a <coughs> dominant uh, regional power changing its orientation from Europe to Islamic world and becoming a new partner for Iran. And Turkish <coughs> government tend to be so stupid to make a statement that if in Security Council Americans are going to put a new resolution against Iran, <coughs> Turkey is going uh, not to support this resolution, which made crazy people in State Department, in Israel, in some other places, who usually used to look at Turkey as a kind of long-lasting, reliable partner. Uh, that's why in current situation, though Turkey is still seen as a strategic partner, and the uh, State Department and Hillary Clinton made a statement that they regret about this resolution which passed through committee in the House of Representatives. But I think in Washington, a lot of people are thinking very seriously what's going to happen to Turkey. That's why uh, it's very interesting. Might be this breakthrough and the new relation is going to make an, uh, the situation completely changed in Southern Caucasian region because Americans would like to have less dependent Armenia, less dependent Southern Caucasian region from Russia, and at once not only through Turkey, but to make some kind of another stronghold in the region, having in mind Middle East, Kurdistan, potential Kurdistan, which could be emerged if Turkey is going to continue this kind of policy, but they are very cautious. I think they are not going to be that stupid all the time, but they are doing something which is <coughs> making uh, nervous uh, Washington and some other, and uh, 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 Tel Aviv. Anyway, in this situation, as I said, there is some interest, but all ter uh, third parties and great powers who are involved they have different, and as I mentioned, and conflicting interests, why they are interested in this breakthrough. But anyway, this breakthrough for Armenians is favorable. It's favorable for Turkey too, but as I said, Turks are might be more, uh, the stakes for Turks are higher than for others because I don't know how that happened, it's for me a mystique. How Turks agreed with this formula without precondition and in a reasonable time frame. It, uh, I, don't, I can't explain. Uh, the, uh, the only explanation is that we remember when Turks uh, decided uh, under the TAR to apply uh, about the retroactivity of genocide resolution of 1948 to the ICTJ, uh, which uh, the organization headed by uh, Ted Sorensen. They wanted to get the answer that it's not retroactive, but they got two answers. It's not retroactive, but what happened at the beginning of century in Turkey, it was genocide. And they were amazed because they got another. I remember in London when Ted Sorensen tell, told them, they said, they were crazy because they were under attack in Turkey that they are idiots, a bunch of idiots. They lost to this uh, three or four Armenians, uh, this, 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 this intellectual fight, because they asked wrong question, or they thought that they are asking a right question, but they got wrong answer. Anyway, and, uh, and here, I'm surprised. They signed the protocol without preconditions, but right at the day of signing this protocol, they wanted to make statement, but they expect 
some serious advancement in Karabakh ish on Karabakh issue, which was the reason why two or three hours were a delay in signing until uh, Hillary Clinton and Sergey Lavrov convinced Turks just and in Albania just don't make any statement, just sign and shut up. They signed and shut up, but after that Erdogan came out and said no. We have to connect this. But when Hillary once was asked, what is the problem? All these Turks are making statements, how we can read the statements. She said, the, the, the most important statement is in protocols. You have to read protocols. If protocol doesn't say anything about this, which means you don't need to uh, pay attention to the statement. But again, as we see, now the situation is very interesting. Uh, last year, President Obama came to power. He was under serious uh, criticism that he is not doing anything in foreign policy. But even not doing anything in foreign policy, he won a Nobel Prize. And I think on Fox News or MSNBC, I hear one guy who said, I can understand if Serge Sarkisian and Gu could get this Nobel Prize because 100 years of you know, hostility, hatred, and they are trying to solve. And I commented at that time, and I said, might be the only reason why uh, Obama got this Nobel Prize because there is a breakthrough in Turkish-Armenian relations, and it's backed by State Department. This is America's uh, biggest victory. No, uh, yeah, I said. We have five minutes. Oh, uh, I. Five I minutes mean, to wrap up the tape. Say, so. Which, which means I minutes. have to put. Well. Um, Pause and five what minutes. Is, you're already over 20 minutes, but. I am. <laughs> oh, I, you don't realize it. Oh, yeah. You say so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that I just, I, I just began. No, no, no. You're I just can, about to end. I can oh, change yeah. it now. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, some facts and some comments and then uh, summarize the situation concerning current protocol. Uh, President Obama promised during the campaign to recognize Armenian genocide. Uh, there was a mediation and protocols were signed in April, yes? No, August? Or, no, no. Uh, protocols were signed, but the decision that protocols will, they were part of the initialization April. April, yeah, in April. Mm. And uh, Armenian government was under very serious attack. Why they uh, made that public on 22nd or 23rd of April? Uh, because they were criticized that this was done in order to block the American uh, attempt to recognize the genocide or on behalf of Obama to use the word of genocide. But Obama in April was in Turkey and said that it's not going to be, not because he is not in favor of recognition, but because he didn't want to make uh, problems on the way of this Armenian-Turkish potential breakthrough. And according to my sources, which is first-hand information, Vice President Biden called to uh, Serge Sarkisian and asked him to reveal the fact of uh, preparation of these protocols and practically uh, initialization, initialization uh, in order to give an opportunity to Obama for face saving and not using the term of genocide because he, he, he just didn't want to create an obstacle on the way of this breakthrough and uh, ratification. But in response, 
Armenian side demanded uh, from Washington to take responsibility. And as a result, came out the statement of State Department that this uh, protocols must be signed and ratified uh, without precondition and in reasonable time frame. Now, why I consider this as a big victory of Armenian diplomacy, <clears throat> I think that Congress was not ready last year to recognize the genocide. Uh, Obama was not ready to use the term genocide, but not doing this, at least Armenians got something from uh, Washington. They made this problem, not just the problem between Turks and Armenians, but they made this problem between Turks, Armenians, and Americans, because State Department openly took responsibility for this. Now, Turks are not going to ratify. They, in October, submit these protocols to Parliament, but it is somewhere, I don't know, in some boxes, in some places, nobody is discussing, nobody has even started to, to discuss this problem. Armenian side is under the attack that Turks are using the Armenian government, Armenians, in order to block the process of recognition and especially the passage of resolution. Armenian side had the idea that might be the deadline must be in February or at least March. They had to uh, uh, make clear for Turks that if Turks are not going to act in accordance with their responsibility to ratify without preconditions and in reasonable time frame, Armenian side is going to get out of the process, just denounce it. And then leaving Turks vis-a-vis Washington, vis-a-vis Brussels, vis-a-vis Russia as unreliable partners, and the government who is not responsible first and second, the government who is continuing this line of denial, and not only denial, Armenia didn't demand them to recognize as a precondition, but even a country who doesn't want to normalize the relations. Nation who committed genocide, and nation who is not only repenting, is not only <coughs> even trying to normalize the relations with this country. And uh, Armenia said, sent a letter to Gil before uh, President Serge Sarkisian on his way to uh, London, to Chatham House. He sent a letter telling all this, but without mentioning the de deadline, that this is the deadline, otherwise we are going to get out. Turkish side is keeping silent and not doing anything only repeatedly putting forward the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh. If there's gonna be any progress over there, then we are going to ratify for three days even. But of course, in Nagorno-Karabakh, the, the biggest problem was the linkage of these two processes. If you are putting Nagorno-Karabakh there, you never can get any result. Because in Nagorno-Karabakh, situation is uh, even more complicated because they, don't, they demand the return back of territories without offering anything in response. Very vague idea of sometimes recognition of some kind of result of some referendum. It's forget. And now, uh, last time, Armenians gave a face-saving opportunity to Washington. This time, Washington is trying to have another face-saving. After the passage of the resolution through the committee in the House, they want to have some result. And in order for Armenians to get not to get out of the process, President Clinton invited Serge Sarkisian to come in April to this summit uh, of, Obama, of Obama 
some it, sometimes we change them. Yeah, which is, uh, they are very similar, like saying, yeah, oh, same with the Palwari. The other guy asked a bit more something, as Berlusconi, <laughs> Berlusconi mentioned. Yeah. Uh, is this summit is a nuclear free world or something like that? Yes, this is the idea of President Obama, and 45 countries of 31 are coming to discuss. And my understanding of the situation is that this President Sarkisian is not supposed to be there. But this is a kind of two-way two you can see the process. First is a gimmick. Otherwise, he will not come to Washington. He would uh, do this process one-sidedly, and he could denounce uh, these protocols and get out blaming Turkey as uh, a not reliable partner. But he is coming now to participate at this summit. and. During this summit, American uh, administration is going to do its final attempt to get this breakthrough, to try to convince Erdogan that it is the time to fix the day <coughs> when they are going to ratify. Otherwise, Armenian side is going to get out. Armenian side make that known its position already to Washington, to Paris, and to Moscow. We'll see what's going to happen. Uh, because otherwise, Armenian government is going to be criticized by diaspora, which was severely against of these uh, protocols, by Dashna, and internally uh, by political opposition, as the administration who failed to achieve some goals was uh, had some illusions, was not very realistic, and all these kind of things. Well, this is the exact situation. If I left something uh, behind, I hope that you can ask some questions, and I'll, I'll better to stop here. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, now we'll, we'll get some comments from uh, Professor Sue. Okay. Well, these were great presentations. They were really good. I mean, we had. We have uh, three people with dissertations and credentials in history. We have two people with credentials in political science. But the historians are, in a way, talking political science. And the, and the political science are well based in history. So the artificial distinctions between these disciplines that often prevent discussion, particularly, I'm afraid to say, University of Michigan, where we've gone so far in this uh, quantitative methodology and rational choice theory, have been broken down here to our advantage. I'm going to uh, uh, form these remarks in the following way. I think that in the periods we're talking about, from 1877 to 2010, Armenia, as a small power, has had to deal with three with living in three different international regimes. From 1877 up to about uh, World War II at least, certainly by 1945, they lived in a world more or less that you can characterize as balance of power. Multi, a, a multitude of different powers contending with each other, empires uh, declining or rising, eventually collapse of empires in 1914, but this, in this multi-centered, poly-centered world, uh, Armenians had to maneuver between these various powers and look for friends uh, and foes. And I think there was a very, very good discussion here in this early period uh, about their inability, and uh, Andre has made this very clear, to find any consonance, any correspondence between the interests of this minority within the Ottoman Empire and, and the interests of the great powers, though at times the great powers used uh, th those, uh, uh, the Armenians as a pawn in their struggles. So that was one regime, the balance of power regime. I'm generalizing. Then in 1945 to roughly 1991, you have this famous Cold War and the bipolar world, two great powers. 
uh, which are supposed to be somehow equivalent to each other. Turns out they're not really. They're both nuclear powers eventually uh, by 1950s, and therefore they could destroy themselves and the world. So there's a kind of balance of terror. But in fact, the United States was far more powerful economically, militarily, and in terms of its alliances than the Soviet Union ever was. The Soviet Union always had to operate during the Cold War from a position of weakness. And therefore, its foreign policy, despite its rhetoric, despite its interventions in the third world, and despite what the West thought about it, revolutionary, going to make the world communist, was actually a very conservative, traditional, landed empire, holding tight to its fragile empire in Eastern Europe, uh, and not particularly expansionist at all. And then in 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you have a new world. You have a unipolar world in which there's only one superpower, or hyperpower, as it's sometimes called, the United States. A new world that, again, smaller countries have to deal with. And in that world, that third world, or the, the, uh, the, the new situation of the unipolar world, uh, you have United, the little Armenia having to deal, essentially, with two countries. One, its northern neighbor and its most reliable, it turns out, ally, Russia. Very weak now. Russia spends about 7% on its military budget, 7% of what the United States spends. And it has to deal with this hyperpower, the United States, which, whose military budget is greater than all other countries in the world combined, right? whose economy is equivalent <coughs> to the next three economies in the world, right? uh, Britain, Germany, and, and Japan. So this is a new, a new regime, a new world. There's never been a power as dominant on the globe as the United States since the Roman Empire. And a great power faced with no enemies, no, no really, we're as, we have, there's no country that seems to want to attack the United States or that can attack the United States. That doesn't mean that the Americans aren't afraid. They're always afraid. They're afraid of communists. They're afraid of terrorists. They're afraid of Islamo-fascists. Whoever you can find, sometimes Libya, sometimes Iran, whoever they, they can always imagine. They're always afraid, but they're unbelievably powerful. Cuba, and Cuba is, of course, you never can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Cuba. <laughs> right. Uh, so they're usually afraid of the South. You know, it comes, you know, Islam or drugs or crime, you know, from the, those Mexicans and so but they're always afraid, but they're unbelievably powerful. These are just realities. Now, in this situation, with no enemy that can stand up to the United States, it can exercise its power quite wantonly. This can actually be a dangerous situation for a hyperpower, because there's no constraints. The Soviet Union at least constrained us from doing certain things, but there's no constraints now. And what Armenia faces is a conflict in the South Caucasus, and elsewhere, but in the South Caucasus, between a global hegemon, a power that wishes to extend its power everywhere in the world, the Pacific, Latin America, the Middle East, and a much weaker, but relatively powerful in its region, regional hegemon, namely Russia. And two years ago, there was a war between Russia and Georgia, which the Georgians initiated, though didn't quite make it in the media in the United States, uh, between Russia and Georgia. And in that war, the situation changed. The United States had been moving into the Caucasus with the hope that they could entice these small countries into NATO. And there was actually discussion in Armenia about joining NATO as well, though it, it, was, it was stopped at a certain point. Azerbaijan was also <coughs> talking about it. But Georgia was actually engaged in actively becoming a part of NATO. We have troops in training, uh, Georgian troops, etc. Uh, and this was seen, as Antonik rightly said, the South Caucasus and North Caucasus is Russia's most vulnerable frontier. You can't imagine how unstable the North Caucasus are. The Chechen war may seem over, but it, this is a politics of, of intimidation, of assassination, of local instability. I mean, it's quite, quite difficult to imagine this. We have nothing like that in the United States. So this is a very vulnerable and, and dangerous area. And Russia, by winning that short war with Georgia, changed the, the, the situation. 
quite drastically. Now the United States has given up on the idea, not rhetorically, we still have that as our policy, but rhetorically we've given up on the idea of bringing either Georgia or Ukraine into NATO. Though we reversed the whole Cold War balance uh, of terror by moving NATO quite significantly into Eastern Europe and even into the Baltic region. Right? There are NATO countries right on the border of Russia. So how does, how does Armenia fit into this then? Well, Armenia is still quite weak. Armenia's most reliable ally remains Russia. And Armenia, like me, for instance, can't figure out what the hell American policy is in the Caucasus. What do they actually want? Okay. Now, Anton Leek has uh, be, uh, given his uh, sort of uh, intimate knowledge of the situation, uh, has argued that at least they want stability, and that stability at the moment is based on supporting this breakthrough, the so-called protocols, between Armenia and Turkey. That seems uh, a, a good thing. Um, and, by the way, <coughs> constraining Georgia. That is, trying to keep Saakashvili a very unpredictable character. Imagine launching an attack on Ossetia when, Russia, when the great neighbor is about to is, is right near, nearby and actually carrying out maneuvers in the North Caucasus and can come through the Roki Tunnel quickly and, 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 uh, and, and uh, your, your attempts. Uh, so th that seems to me, and of course, keeping friendly relations with Azerbaijan, which has, we have real economic relations with, uh, and so forth. What American policy is not about, even under the idealistic, uh, idealistic in quotes, Obama regime, is democratization. We are perfectly willing to accept uh, the move toward authoritarianism in, uh, in these, all three of these countries, even in Georgia. Georgia, too, has moved significantly from the Rose Revolution <coughs> toward a more uh, censorious and authoritarian regime. So that's the situation. Armenia still has to maneuver within this, uh, the uh, situation. I think one of the consequences of the Georgian War, like our uh, various uh, uh, experts on international relations to comment on this, uh, is uh, one, of, one of the consequences is uh, that Russia is the principal player here. Uh, the United States has a much weaker hand now. It always has a powerful hand because it's so powerful. But if there's going to be solutions to these problems, like the Karabakh problem, it's Russia who's basically going to, going to play the key role, and that has to be recognized. And yet the United States, at least rhetorically, is unwilling to accept publicly the idea that Russia has a regional hegemonic uh, role in this area. We don't recognize their security sphere or their sphere of influence or interest in the South Caucasus, or for that matter, in Central Asia. That's my major point. I want to say something else to the earlier part of the discussion. Um, it seems to me that my, what I was asking in that question was, that we have to consider carefully not whether or not uh, Armenians were in, oppressed in the, the Ottoman Empire. That's a matter of perception and, and definition. Not whether uh, the young Turk government felt threatened or not, as if it were a real threat, but rather how each of the actors imagined and constructed the world they were living in and imagined and constructed their own sense of fear and threat, and imagined and constructed how they thought they could get out of it. What was their political utopia? What was their idea of the future that would be acceptable? Now, it may be, and I'm more and more tending toward this view, that the situation, given these different constructions, was, is best understood not as, as, as if there would be some liberal redemption, some way out, but as a tragedy, in which inexorably, though actors have choices in history, they were moving toward a situation where one after another alternative was cut off, and ultimately the choice of genocide was the one that made the most sense to the young Turk leaders. As horrible as it was, it was in their own understanding of the world the most rational. Now, my own view is that politics is made within these discursive constructions, within these universes of meaning, 
as well as what I call, as well as what I call uh, affective dispositions. That is, emotional environments in which you feel a threat from some people, friendliness and possibility from others, in which you construct enemies in a certain way, and in that, dis in that uh, affective disposition, in this emotional way that young Turks thought about Armenians by 1914, 1915, they were seen as an existential threat, as a threat to the existence of Turkey in a very dangerous world. It's not accidental that the genocide occurred just at the moment that the Constantinople seemed threatened, that troops were landing in Gallipoli uh, in, after the defeat at Sarikomish, uh, in which it, it was imagined that Armenians had participated and caused this defeat. So it's in that particular environment, that understanding, that affective disposition, that the Young Turks took this policy, this drastic and ultimately irrational policy. It's not that they were in any way justified in doing this. It's that they were thinking in this pathological way about this threat, imagining it far greater than it was. It wasn't, it wasn't actually uh, the major threat to their empire, particularly if what Michael is saying, and if we look at the history, there's far more Kurdish revolts and far more dangers from, danger from Kurds in the 19th and 20th century than there were from Armenians. The great bulk of Armenians actually we're trying to find some solution within the Ottoman Empire. One of the problems Armenian revolutionaries had, and this is the insight from Girard's own dissertation, was that they couldn't very effectively mobilize their population. They had tremendous difficulty convincing Armenians that they ought to fight, or that they ought to organize to fight the Turkish Empire. It was extraordinarily difficult, and that's a collective action problem. How do you convince people to give up their own personal self-interest and act in this, this collective way uh, against some enemy. Very, very difficult. The Armenian revolutionaries are a key actor here, but not the only Armenian actor. Armenian revolutionaries were also, at the same time, and this Shiraz's point is very well taken here, Armenians are also actors. They're not just victims. They play a role, and they cause things to happen, right? Uh, from a position of weakness. Uh, that's extraordinarily important. Armenian historians don't like that. They, they don't want to talk about the Armenians. Dashnak, uh, uh, Tsuchun doesn't want to talk about collaboration with, with the Ottoman Empire, which was part of the reality. Armenian revolutionaries were constructing their own realities. They were very fearful of, that Armenians were about to disappear. They were going to be annihilated, either through their own inactivity uh, or the actions of the Turks. Uh, they, were, they, uh, they had a certain construction of uh, Turkish aims, which were very much a zero-sum game. Uh, they were concerned with what they might expect or not expect, and they were expecting less and less from Europe over time. Uh, so all of these things are important. The genocide itself occurs after the Turks have come to the conclusion that the Armenians are the major threat because of their connection to Europe. And that uh, 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 there are two, two things that I think we've learned from our Watts conferences over the last 10 years. And one is that after the Balkan Wars, there's a shift from concentration on a possibility of, of an Ottoman Empire that would still have some hold on the Balkans to centering the idea of the Ottoman homeland in Anatolia. And Fouad Dindar's work, uh, uh, which has emphasized how the, the young Turk government began to think more and more about homogenizing and shifting the demography of that part of the world, which then became, of course, a major threat to the Armenians and, in fact, leads into the, the genocide. So that's one huge thing. Uh, and the, the, uh, the second thing that uh, happens, of course, is right on the eve of World War I that Europe successfully imposes a solution, a reform on the Ottoman Empire. And there's about to be inspectors coming to the Ottoman Empire to change the nature of that empire. The war breaks out, the Turks make the war break out, they join the war, and they immediately end that reform. But the Armenians are the wedge. They are the wedge that's going to come into that empire potentially in the future. And so war uh, and this uh, affective disposition, which you imagine this threat far greater than it might have been, it ain't 
It's not that it isn't a potential threat. Uh, I, I've had this debate with Jira. Threats are always perceptions. Threats are always imagined. Right? If a guy has a gun to your head, your imagination that, that it's a danger might be more rational than not. But of course, it could be a friend playing with a toy gun. It could be a friend with a gun that's not loaded. It could be all kinds of things. But if you imagine threats in the future, oh, Iraq might have weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, we have to have preventive war against it. You can see how that imagined future threat that you can act on, and people will die because you act on that threat, is in fact something that is perceived and not necessarily rational. And in that way, the Turks, through their pathological construction of the Armenians, create a situation in which they then are able to do the most in unimaginable thing, which is to begin the systematic deportation and murder of their subject population. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> we'll have uh, about an hour, just a little over an hour. Uh, what I propose to do is we have already two questions that have uh, been asked. Uh, I'll open up to a couple of more questions in the first round and then have reactions to what has been said and then uh, we'll have more questions and discussions. Any questions you want to add to what we have already? Uh, I have a technical question. I was going to say, if um, you're anticipating an hour, I can change the tape now, which is an hour, and then we don't need to have any more technical breaks. Well, uh, let's we go have half an hour ten left. Minutes. I'm sorry? We have half an hour left. Oh, oh, let's go another 10 minutes, and then you put in. Okay. Then we'll be sure that we okay. can go another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. I, I do have a question for the panel. Um, so it is clear to me that intervention uh, is not happening only during conflict times. Um, third parties intervention happen during peace times as well as during conflict times. So my question is, what does the, what kind of role does the conflict play in intervention? Is the conflict um, Conflict, can we see the conflict as a rupture? So you have new agendas rising from these new circumstances. Or is the conflict just an opportunity in other circumstances to just continue the interest of the, of the main powers? So my, my, my point is also what kind of periodization do we look at? Do we just look at intervention during the conflict? Mm -hmm. Or do we imagine and envision a longer period of time where influencing inter intervention started way before and will continue way after the conflict. And so um, does the conflict, in, 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 if we frame it in a, in a broader um, time period, does the conflict play a role in, in raising new agendas, new uh, sets of, of forces and powers? Or is it just, you know, the, the history of continuing? And it was very, it was striking to me that, you know, Russia came, you know, uh, all of you talked about Re Russia as this continuous power playing a major role in the region and in the national interest of the several um, states. So um, my point is, is the genocide or the uh, uh, World War I, the Cold War, and all of the different conflicts, do they play a role, do they reshape the way interventions are, you know, uh, uh, done? Or are we just hearing here the story of the continuity you know, continuous um, um, situation with the same um, great powers having the same imperialistic or when whatever you call it interest. So that's that's my question. Thank you. Um, just a note: when we start answering, please uh, formulate the question so that it's recorded and uh, we remember what you're answering. Uh, and one other question. Not we can go to yeah, Milena. Um, so Armand was talking about um, how to the extent to which um, the elites are insulated from the consequences of the revolution kind of um, has a big effect on the outcomes. So I was wondering how exactly that has played out um, in the case of the um, Armenian diaspora, as Gerard phrased the diaspora as the third party itself. Um, because I know that when I think of um, elites versus masses in terms of revolution um, and the people that are radicalized partake in it, um, like I'm referring back to the Bulgarian experience, in which case elites were more or less on the front line, but I realize the third in this case. 
Okay, um, let's start with Michael. Uh, who has some earlier questions. Good. And let's try to manage our time a little. Okay. Um, I guess uh, to start off, let me just say, echo uh, Ron's point at the beginning of um, the, this panel has succeeded in uh, blending, I think, the best of political science with the best of history. And I just wanted to add that I think the, this Turkish Armenian case is an example of where we really need the two disciplines and more. There are others beyond that uh, to cooperate, in that historians really, I think, to understand the relations better need to compare the theoretical framework that uh, political scientists bring so they aren't caught up in the details of what they're talking about. You can see, well, there are some more general patterns of behavior that you can see elsewhere. Likewise, I think any uh, political scientist studying this region also but needs to understand how the his history has shaped, or the perceptions of history have shaped the agendas and perspectives of the actors involved, because um, that is extraordinarily important. Um, uh, Antonis, I, I thought uh, his point about how growing Turkish strength um, is, today has, uh, has Washington alarmed. And then I think you tied that to the, the Kurdish um, question in, in Turkey. And this reminded me today of how there is absolute, I think a widely shared uh, conviction throughout Turkish society that the outside powers, today the United States being the greatest one in particular, always want to use Turkey's internal problems as a way to keep it weak. And this brings me back to um, the uh, World War I period and the period right before. There was a, um, a report in 1916 that Talat Pasha, then the Interior Ministry, he commissioned a report by the Foreign Ministry to look at the Armenian question uh, in international relations, that is, between the Ottoman Empire and relations with the great powers. And the report concluded that all of the great powers, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Russians and the British, have always used the Armenians against uh, us as a wedge to our empire. But also the report point, so did the Germans, so did the Italians, so did the Austrians. So there's this conviction among the Ottomans, all the great, this is really, it's just the front. This issue, issue. they're, they're uh, extraordinarily disingenuous again, uh, in using it against them. One reason why uh, they are convinced of this is that, you know, as Ron mentioned, in 1914, you have in February the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire um, with uh, other uh, outside powers looking on after negotiations that go back and forth for about a year, agree to overhaul the administration of Eastern Anatolia and to bring in outside uh, European uh, governors who will then be uh, handling the administration of Eastern Anatolia. At the same time, throughout this period, throughout 1913 and up until this uh, treaty is signed and then thereafter, the, the situation is you have Russia putting pressure upon the Ottomans. You've got to increase uh, security in eastern Anatolia. There is, there's too much chaos there. We don't want it spilling over our borders. And if you don't do it, we will intervene. So that seems fine. It seems where you have positive uh, third party intervention. There is a problem here. Uh, Armenians, in particular, are exposed uh, to raids. They aren't protected by uh, the Ottoman administration. Uh, the Ottoman administration, in some cases, seems to be winking at uh, these attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Yet at the same time, and this is where the Kurdish uh, question comes back in, the Ottomans know very well, as do the other great powers, the British and the Germans uh, and the French, know that the Russians are at the same time working with Kurdish rebels and encouraging them to carry out attacks inside the Ottoman Empire. That is, you have at the same time the Russians are banging the table, telling the Ottomans you better institute reforms and make better and secure this region Yet, under the table, they're also, it looks like they're doing their best to destabilize it. Um, now, there's this, it's not purely this company, or the Russians really playing a double game here? They are. Are they doing it intentionally? Maybe not, because the Russian concern is, if we don't start cultivating support among the Kurds, what happens if the Ottoman Empire collapses, as looks more and more likely at the end of the, uh, at the, Bal the Balkan Wars, actually not so much collapses, but will be torn apart by outside powers. We might be faced with either what we today we would call a failed state, um, which will be become a base essentially for terrorism and subversion against our empire, and worse again, that this might come under German and, and, and French and British influence. And so, the, but the Ottomans, to their perspective, this is all being engineered by the outside powers. On the one hand, they demand institute reforms to protect Armenians, yet at the same time, if they're telling us to do this, they are destabilizing the situation by uh, stoking the conflict between uh, the tribes um, and the Armenians. Um, 
I, there, I could go on and make some other points about Armenian agency. I don't know if I should I, uh, do I have time to do that? Or should well, I? Let's, let's get just quick responses to the questions mm -hmm. and then uh, we can go to the I, Because this was, this, my thinking on this was sparked by the question of your question, Sarah, yes, mm -hmm. uh, your, your question regarding um, the impact of, uh, of the conflicts. Has intervention changed in relation to the dynamics on the ground? How has that changed uh, intervention? Or is it pretty much just always the same thing? Um, and the question, you have wartime and peacetime. And what strikes me when looking at the history of Eastern Anatolia, there really isn't that great a differentiate. There's always a conflict going on there. And that's one of the problems that this, it's a simmering kind of almost low level, warfare is too strong a term. Um, but on the, by the summer of 19, so this is throughout the 1890s and then um, the beginning of the 20th century up until World War I. And on the eve of World War I, on both sides of the border, before a formal, uh, formal declaration of hostilities or the, the attacks are carried out, you find increasing tensions on both sides. So you have cross-border raids being made. You have um, you know, pogroms carried out against um, Armenians uh, in the uh, Ottoman side. You have on the Iranian side that's occupied by Russia and in the Caucasus, you have attacks on Muslims, confiscation of property, et cetera. Uh, before the war actually is broken out, so you have this building up of hostilities. And so you see a market increase in 1914, but <coughs> throughout 1913, 1912, 1911, there is, um, there's always a steady, there's a, there's a covert struggle going. It's covert and not so covert. Covert on the side of the great powers and not so covert on the part of the local actors, who are all of them very concerned. They all know that the, or believe that the future of this region is going to be determined by the outside powers. So how do we adjust ourselves to that? And this, I guess, comes to the question of Armenian agency. Really, they are in a very difficult position because it's not possible to just sit quiet. I mean, this you know, the, the Turkish response um, uh, that sort of, well, the Armenians brought it on themselves. They made the choice to collaborate with the Russians, and they got what they deserved. Um, I mean, that, that's, uh, for a number of obvious reasons, it's quite, only a really quite an offensive thing to say. And when you look more closely, there are two things in mind. One, I mean, in my estimation, one, they, they don't have really very many, they have no good options, number one. Number two, what I was struck by is the collaboration, many of them, well, most I think were quite hesitant about collaboration, and many opposed it, is, um, according to the sources that I've read, um, and these are Russian sources who are following very closely to Dostoevsky's tune, on the eve of this reform uh, program in 1914, in, in, in February 1914, which looks odd, this is a triumph for the Armenians because now they have the, the great powers in Russia in particular have forced the Ottomans to overhaul the administration of Eastern Anatolia and to put that administration under the control of uh, Europeans, which looks like we've seen the same pattern in the Balkans. This was conducted and the Ottomans lost those territories and the Ottomans are convinced this is a new Macedonia. We're gonna lose this too. That is the great powers go and they stoke conflicts, then they put in their own administrators and then they take it from us. The Dash, a significant group of the Dashnak Sechunit did not want to go along with, they opposed this reform program. Why? Because as if this is going to lead, they were one of the few groups that with the CUP and opposing this because both CUP fearing this, we're gonna lose this territory for good to the Russians, as did the Dashnak Sechun. And I don't know, there was somebody, uh, put this, well, I don't know if it's you, Gerard, but in, uh, someone can uh, tell me where this came from, but the problem for the Armenians was that the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman state was too weak because they couldn't control what was going on in Eastern Anatolia. I could go into detail of why that is. They couldn't get um, a handle on it. The Russian state was too strong. That is, the Arme Ottoman Armenians in Eastern Anatolia were exposed to raiding. Um, they were exploited. And they could not, it was impossible, it's too much to demand that they sit there and simply uh, take their lot. On the other hand, though, there was a fear among many of the revolutionaries that this territory is also now dominated by the Russians they're going to essentially uh, snuff us out. Um, and so you have, in fact, that doesn't mean in 1914, a real split among the revolutionaries, who many of them really are, are very wary of this territory, of greater Russian influence in this territory. Thanks, Mark. Mm. Um, I'll begin with uh, Andranik's question about... Uh, uh, okay. Hold on, Mark. Okay. Uh, Morse says we should start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just did the last thing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, 
some facts and some comments and then uh, summarize the situation concerning current protocol. Uh, President Obama promised during the campaign to recognize Armenian genocide. Uh, there was a mediation and protocols were signed in April, yes? No, August or no, no. Uh, protocols were signed, but the decision that protocols was, they were part, 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 part. the initialization the of April. 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 Yeah, in April. Mm. And uh, Armenian government was under very serious attack why they uh, made that public on 22nd or 23rd of April. Uh, because they were criticized that this was done in order to block the American uh, attempt to recognize the genocide or on behalf of Obama to use the word of genocide. But Obama in April was in Turkey and said that it's not going to be, not because he is not in favor of recognition, but because he didn't want to make uh, problems on the way of this Armenian Turkish potential breakthrough. And according to my <coughs> sources, which is first hand information, Vice President Biden called to uh, Serge Sarkisian and asked him to reveal the fact of uh, preparation of these protocols and practically. Initialization uh, in order to give an opportunity to Obama for face saving and not using the term of genocide because he, he, he just didn't want to create an obstacle on the way of this breakthrough and uh, ratification. But in response, Armenian side demanded uh, from Washington to take responsibility. And as a result, came out the statement of State Department that these uh, protocols must be signed and ratified uh, without precondition and in reasonable time frame. Now, why I consider this as a big victory of Armenian diplomacy, <clears throat> I think that Congress was not ready last year to recognize the genocide. Uh, Obama was not ready to use the term genocide, but not doing this, at least Armenians got something from uh, Washington. They made this problem, not just the problem between Turks and Armenians, but they made this problem between Turks, Armenians, and Americans, because State Department openly took responsibility for this. Now, Turks are not going to ratify. They, in October, submit these protocols to Parliament, but it is somewhere, I don't know, in some boxes, in some places, nobody is discussing, nobody has even started to to discuss this problem. Armenian side is under the attack that Turks are using Armenian government, Armenian, in order to block the process of recognition and especially the passage of resolution. Armenian side have the idea that might be the deadline must be in February or at least March. They had to uh, uh, make clear for Turks that if Turks are not going to act in accordance with their responsibility to ratify without preconditions and in reasonable time frame, Armenian side is going to get out of the process, just denounce it. And then leaving Turks vis a vis Washington, vis a vis Brussels, vis a vis Russia as unreliable partners and the government who is not responsible first and second 
the government who is continuing this line of denial, and not only denial, I mean, I didn't demand them to recognize as a precondition, but even a country who doesn't want to normalize the relation. Nation who committed genocide, and nation who is not only repenting, is not only <coughs> even trying to normalize the relations with this country. And uh, Armenian side sent a letter to Gil before uh, President Serge Sarkisian on his way to uh, London, to Chatham House. He sent a letter telling all this, but without mentioning the de deadline, that this is the deadline, otherwise we are going to get out. Turkish side is keeping silent and not doing anything. Only repeatedly putting forward the problem of nagorno karabakh If there is going to be any progress over there, then we are going to ratify for three days even. But of course, in nagorno karabakh the, the biggest problem was the linkage of these two processes. If you are putting nagorno karabakh there, you never can get any result. Because in nagorno karabakh situation is uh, even more complicated. Because they, don't, they demand the return back of territories without offering anything in response. Very vague idea of sometimes recognition of some kind of result of some referendum. It's forget. And now, uh, last time, Armenians gave a face-saving opportunity to Washington. This time, Washington is trying to have another face-saving. After the passage of the resolution through the committee in the House, they want to have some result. And in order for Armenians to get not to get out of the process, President Clinton invited Serge Sarkisian to come in April to this summit of uh, Obama. Of Obama, Obama summit. Sometimes we change that. Yeah, which is uh, they are very similar. The other guy has a bit more something that Berlusconi <laughs> mentioned. Yeah. Uh, this, this summit is a nuclear free world or something like that. Yes. This is the idea of President Obama, and 45 countries of 41 are coming to this guy. And my understanding of the situation is that this President Sarkisian is not supposed to be there. But this is a kind of two, two way you can see the process. First is a gimmick. Otherwise, he will not come to Washington. He would uh, do this process one-sidedly, and he could denounce uh, these protocols and get out blaming Turkey as, uh, as not reliable partner. But he is coming now to participate at this summit. And during this summit, American uh, administration is going to do its final attempt to get this breakthrough, to try to convince Erdogan that it is the time to fix the day <coughs> when they are going to ratify. Otherwise, Armenian side is going to get out. Armenian side made that known its position already to Washington, to Paris, and to Moscow. We'll see what's going to happen. Uh, because otherwise, Armenian government is going to be criticized by diaspora, which was severely against of this uh, protocols, by Dashnak, and internally uh, by political opposition as the administration who failed to achieve some goals, was uh, had some illusions, was not very realistic, and all these kind of things. Well, this is the exact situation. If I left something uh, behind, I hope that you can ask some questions, and I'll, I'll better to stop here. Thanks, Andra. Uh, now we'll, we'll get some comments from uh, 
uh, professors. Okay. Well, these were great presentations. They were really good. I mean, we had we have uh, three people with dissertations and credentials in history. We have two people with credentials in political science. But the historians are, in a way, talking political science. And the, and the political scientists are well based in history. So the artificial distinctions between these disciplines that often prevent discussion, particularly, I'm afraid to say, at the University of Michigan, where we've gone so far in this uh, quantitative methodology and rational choice theory, have been broken down here to our advantage. I'm going to uh, uh, form these remarks in the following way. I think that in the periods we're talking about, from 1877 to 2010, Armenia, as a small power, has had to deal with three, with living in three different international regimes. From 1877 up to about uh, World War II, at least, certainly by 1945, they lived in a world more or less that you can characterize as balance of power. Multi, a, a multitude of different powers contending with each other, empires uh, declining or rising, eventually collapse of empires in 1914. But this, in this multi-centered, poly-centered world, uh, Armenians had to maneuver between these various powers and look for friends uh, and foes. And I think there was a very, very good discussion here in this early period uh, about their inability, and uh, Andre has made this very clear, to find any consonance, any correspondence between the interests of this minority within the Ottoman Empire and, and the interests of the great powers, though at times the great powers used uh, the, those, uh, uh, the Armenians as a pawn in their struggles. So that was one regime, the balance of power regime. I'm generalizing. Then in 1945 to roughly 1991, you have this famous Cold War and the bipolar world, two great powers, uh, which are supposed to be somehow equivalent to each other. Turns out they're not really. They're both nuclear powers, eventually, uh, by 1950s, and therefore they could destroy themselves and the world, so there's a kind of balance of terror. But in fact, the United States was far more powerful economically, militarily, and in terms of its alliances than the Soviet Union ever was. The Soviet Union always had to operate during the Cold War from a position of weakness. And therefore, its foreign policy, despite its rhetoric, despite its interventions in the Third World, and despite what the West thought about it, revolutionary, going to make the world communist, was actually a very conservative, traditional, landed empire, holding tight to its fragile empire in Eastern Europe, uh, and not particularly expansionist at all. And then in 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you have a new world. You have a unipolar world in which there's only one superpower, or hyperpower, as it's sometimes called, the United States. A new world that, again, smaller countries have to deal with. And in that world, that third world, or the, the, uh, the, the new situation of the unipolar world, uh, you have United, the little Armenia having to deal essentially with two countries. One, its northern neighbor and its most reliable, it turns out, ally, Russia. Very weak now. Russia spends about 7% on its military budget, 7% of what the United States spends. And it has to deal with this hyperpower, the United States, which, whose military budget is greater than all other countries in the world combined whose economy is equivalent <coughs> to the next three economies in the world, right? uh, Britain, Germany, and, and Japan. So this is a new, a new regime, a new world. There's never been a power as dominant on the globe as the United States since the Roman Empire. And a great power faced with no enemies, no, no really, we're as, we have, there's no country that seems to want to attack the United States, or that can attack the United States. That doesn't mean that the Americans aren't afraid. They're always afraid. They're afraid of communists. They're afraid of terrorists. They're afraid of Islamofascists, wherever you can find. Sometimes Libya, sometimes Iran. 
whoever they, they always imagine, they're always afraid, but they're unbelievably powerful. Cuba, and Cuba is, of course, you never can tell them. Yeah. <laughs> Cuba. Right. Uh, so they're usually afraid of the South, you know, of what comes you know, Islam or drugs or crime, you know, from those Mexicans and so But they're always afraid, but they're unbelievably powerful. These are just realities. Now, in this situation, with no enemy that can stand up to the United States, it can exercise its power quite wantonly. This can actually be a dangerous situation for a hyperpower, because there's no constraints. The Soviet Union at least constrained us from doing certain things, but there's no constraints now. And what Armenia faces is a conflict in the South Caucasus, and elsewhere, but in the South Caucasus, between a global hegemon a power that wishes to extend its power everywhere in the world, the Pacific, Latin America, the Middle East, and a much weaker, but relatively powerful in its region, regional hegemon, namely Russia. And two years ago, there was a war between Russia and Georgia, which the Georgians initiated, though didn't quite make it in the media in the United States, uh, between Russia and Georgia, and in that war, the situation changed. The United States had been moving into the Caucasus with the hope that they could entice these small countries into NATO. And there was actually discussion in Armenia about joining NATO as well, though it, it, was, it was stopped at a certain point. Azerbaijan was also <coughs> talking about it. But Georgia was actually engaged in actively becoming a part of NATO. We have troops in training, uh, Georgian troops, etc. Uh, and this was seen, as Andranik rightly said, the South Caucasus and North Caucasus is Russia's most vulnerable frontier. You can't imagine how unstable the North Caucasus are. The Chechen war may seem over, but it, this is a politics of, of intimidation, of assassination, of local instability. I mean, it's quite, quite difficult to imagine this. We have nothing like that in the United States. So this is a very vulnerable and, and dangerous area. And Russia, by winning that short war with Georgia, changed the, the, the situation quite drastically. Now the United States has given up on the idea, not rhetorically, we still have that as our policy, but rhetorically we've given up on the idea of bringing either Georgia or Ukraine into NATO. Though we reversed the whole Cold War balance uh, of terror by moving NATO quite significantly into Eastern Europe and even into the Baltic region. Right? There, NATO countries right on the border of Russia. So how does, how does Armenia fit into this then? Well, Armenia is still quite weak. Armenia's most reliable ally remains Russia. And Armenia, like me for instance, can't figure out what the hell American policy is in the Caucasus. What do they actually want? Right? Now Antonik has uh, given his uh, sort of uh, intimate knowledge of the situation, uh, has argued that at least they want stability, and that stability at the moment is based on supporting this breakthrough, the so-called protocols, between Armenia and Turkey. That seems uh, a, a good thing. Um, and by the way, <coughs> constraining Georgia, that is trying to keep Saakishvili a very unpredictable character Imagine launching an attack on Ossetia when Russia, when the great neighbor is about to, is, is right near, nearby and actually carrying out maneuvers in the North Caucasus and can come through the Roki Tunnel quickly and, 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 uh, and, and uh, your, your attempts. Uh, so th that seems to me, and of course, keeping friendly <coughs> relations with Azerbaijan, which has, we have re economic relations with, uh, and so forth. What American policy is not about, even under the idealistic, uh, idealistic in quotes, Obama regime, is democratization. We are perfectly willing to accept uh, the move toward authoritarianism in, uh, in these, all three of these countries, even in Georgia. Georgia, too, has moved significantly from the Rose Revolution <coughs> toward a more uh, censorious and authoritarian regime. So that's the situation. Armenia still has to maneuver within this uh, the, uh, situation. I think one of the consequences of the Georgian War, like our uh, various uh, uh, experts on international relations to comment on this, uh, is 
uh, one, of, one of the consequences is uh, that Russia is the principal player here. Uh, the United States has a much weaker hand now. It always has a powerful hand because it's so powerful. But if there's going to be solutions to these problems, like the Karabakh problem, it's Russia who's basically going to, going to play the key role, and that has to be recognized. And yet the United States, at least rhetorically, is unwilling to accept publicly the idea that Russia has a regional hegemonic uh, role in this area. We don't recognize their security sphere or their sphere of influence or interest in the South Caucasus, or for that matter, in Central Asia. That's my major point. I want to say something else to the earlier part of the discussion. Um, it seems to me that my, what I was asking in that question was that we have to consider carefully not whether or not uh, Armenians were in, oppressed in the, the Ottoman Empire. That's a matter of perception and, and definition. Not whether uh, the young Turk government felt threatened or not, as if it were a real threat, but rather how each of the actors imagined and constructed the world they were living in. And imagined and constructed their own sense of fear and threat, and imagined and constructed how they thought they could get out of it. What was their political utopia? What was their idea of the future that would be acceptable? Now, it may be, and I'm more and more tending toward this view, that the situation, given these different constructions, was is best understood not as, as, as if there would be some liberal redemption, some way out, but as a tragedy, in which inexorably, Though actors have choices in history, they were moving toward a situation where one after another alternative was cut off, and ultimately the choice of genocide was the one that made the most sense to the young Turk leaders. As horrible as it was, it was in their own understanding of the world the most rational. Now, my own view is that politics is made within these discursive constructions, within these universes of meaning, as well as what I call, as well as what I call uh, affective dispositions. That is, emotional environments in which you feel a threat from some people, friendliness and possibility from others, in which you construct enemies in a certain way, and in that, dis in that uh, affective disposition, in this emotional way that young Turks thought about Armenians, by 1914-1915, they were seen as an existential threat, as a threat to the existence of Turkey in a very dangerous world. It's not accidental that the genocide occurred just at the moment that the Constantinople seemed threatened, that troops were landing in Gallipoli uh, in, after the defeat at Sarikomish, uh, in which it, it was imagined that Armenians had participated and caused this defeat. So in that particular environment, that understanding, that affective disposition, that the young Turks took this policy, this drastic and ultimately irrational policy. It's not that they were in any way justified in doing this. It's that they were thinking in this pathological way about this threat, imagining it far greater than it was. It wasn't, it wasn't actually uh, the major threat to their empire, particularly if what Michael is saying, and if we look at the history, there's far more Kurdish revolts and far more dangers from, danger from Kurds in the 19th and 20th century than there were from Armenians. The great bulk of Armenians actually were trying to find some solution within the Ottoman Empire. One of the problems Armenian revolutionaries had, and this is the, the insight from Zirar's own dissertation, was that they couldn't very effectively mobilize their population. They had tremendous difficulty convincing Armenians that they ought to fight or that they ought to organize to fight the Turkish Empire. It was extraordinarily difficult. And that's a collective action problem. How do you convince people to give up their own personal self-interest and act in this, this collective way uh, against some enemy? Very, very difficult. The Armenian revolutionaries are a key actor here, but not the only Armenian actor. Armenian revolutionaries were also, at the same time, and this Shiraz's point is very well taken here, Armenians are also actors. They're not just victims. They play a role, and they cause things to happen, right? Uh, from a position of weakness. Uh, that's extraordinarily important. Armenian historians don't like that. 
they, they don't want to talk about the Armenians. That's not, uh, Tzuchun doesn't want to talk about collaboration with, with the Ottoman Empire, which was part of the reality. Armenian revolutionaries were constructing their own realities. They were very fearful of that Armenians were about to disappear. They were going to be annihilated, either through their own inactivity uh, or the actions of the Turks. Uh, they, were, they, uh, they had a certain construction of uh, Turkish aims, which were very much a zero-sum game. Uh, they were concerned with what they might expect or not expect, and they were expecting less and less from Europe over time. Uh, so all of these things are important. The genocide itself occurs after the Turks have come to the conclusion that the Armenians are the major threat because of their connection to Europe. And that uh, 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 there are two, two things that I think we've learned from our Watts conferences over the last 10 years. And one is that after the Balkan Wars, there's a shift from concentration on a possibility of, of an Ottoman Empire that would still have some hold on the Balkans to centering the idea of the Ottoman homeland in Anatolia. And Fouad Dindar's work, uh, uh, which has emphasized how the, the young Turk government began to think more and more about homogenizing and shifting the demography of that part of the world, which then became, of course, a major threat to the Armenians and, in fact, leads into the, the genocide. So that's one huge thing. Uh, and the, the, uh, the second thing that uh, happens, of course, is right on the eve of World War I that Europe successfully imposes a solution, a reform on the Ottoman Empire. And there's about to be inspectors coming to the Ottoman Empire to change the nature of that empire. The war breaks out. The Turks make the war break out. They join the war. And they immediately end that reform. But the Armenians are the wedge. They are the wedge that's going to come into that empire potentially in the future. And so war uh, and this uh, affective disposition, which you imagine this threat far greater than it might have been, it ain't. it's not that it isn't a potential threat. Uh, I, I've had this debate with Jira. Threats are always perceptions. Threats are always imagined. Right? If a guy has a gun to your head, your imagination that, that it's a danger might be more rational than not. But of course, it could be a friend playing with a toy gun. It could be a friend with a gun that's not loaded. It could be all kinds of things. But if you imagine threats in the future, oh, Iraq might have weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, we have to have preventive war against it. You can see how that imagined future threat that you can act on, and people will die because you act on that threat, is in fact something that is perceived and not necessarily rational. And in that way, the Turks, through their pathological construction of the Armenians, create a situation in which they then are able to do the most in unimaginable thing, which is to begin the systematic deportation and murder of their subject population. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> we'll have uh, about an hour, just a little over an hour. Uh, what I propose to do is we have already two questions that have uh, been asked. Uh, I'll open up to a couple of more questions in the first round, and then have reactions to what has been said, and then uh, we'll have more questions and discussions. Any questions you want to add to what we have already? Uh, I have a technical question. I was going to say, if um, you're anticipating an hour, I can change the tape now, which is an hour, and then we don't need to have any more technical breaks. Well, uh, let's we go have another half an hour left. Minutes. I'm sorry? We have half an hour left. Oh, on the let's program. go another 10 minutes, and then you put in. Okay. And then we'll be sure that we can okay. go another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. I, I do have a question for the panel. Um, so it is clear to me that intervention uh, is not happening only during conflict times. Um, third parties' intervention happen during peace times as well as during conflict times. So my question is, what does the, what kind of role does the conflict play in intervention? Is the conflict um, Conflict, can we see the conflict as a rupture? So you have new agendas rising from these new circumstances. 
or is the conflict just an opportunity in other circumstances to just continue the interest of the of the main powers? So my 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 point is also what kind of periodization do we look at? Do we just look at intervention during the conflict, mm -hmm. or do we imagine and envision a longer period of time where influence and inter intervention started way before and will continue way after the conflict? And so uh, does the conflict in, 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 if we frame it in a, in a broader uh, time period, does the conflict play a role in, in raising new agendas, new uh, sets of, of forces and powers, or is it just you know the, a history of continuing? And it was very it was striking to me that you know Russia came you know uh, all of you talked about Re Russia as this continuous power playing a major role in the region and in the national interest of the several um, states. So um, my point is, is the genocide or the uh, uh, World War One, the Cold War, and all of the different conflicts, do they play a role? Do they reshape the way interventions are, you know, uh, uh, done, or are we just hearing here the story of a continuing, you know, continuous um, um, situation with the same um, great powers having the same imperialistic or when whatever you call it interest? So that's, that's my question. Thank you. Um, just a note, when we start answering, please uh, formulate the question so that it's recorded and uh, we remember what you're answering. Uh, and one other question, if not, we can go to, yeah, Milena. Um, so Armand was talking about um, how the extent to which um, elites are insulated from the consequences of the revolution kind of um, has a big impact on the outcomes. So I was wondering how exactly that has played out um, in the case of the um, Armenian diaspora, as Gerard framed the diaspora as a third party itself. Um, because I know that when I think of um, elites versus masses in terms of revolution um, and the people that are radicalized partake in it, um, like I'm referring back to the Bulgarian experience, which case leads to more or less in the front line, but I realize it's very different in this case. Okay, um, let's start with Michael, uh, answering earlier questions, sure. and let's try to manage our time a little. Okay, um, I guess uh, to start off, let me just say, echo uh, Ron's point at the beginning of um, the, this panel has succeeded in uh, blending, I think, the best of political science with the best of history. And I just wanted to add that I think the, this Turkish-Armenian case is an example of where we really need the two disciplines and more. There are others beyond that uh, to cooperate. In that historians really, I think, to understand the relations better, need to compare the theoretical framework that uh, political scientists bring, so they aren't caught up in the details of what they're talking about. You can see, well, there are some more general patterns of behavior that you can see elsewhere. Likewise, I think any uh, political scientist studying this region also but needs to understand how the his history has shaped, or the perceptions of history have shaped the agendas and perspectives of the actors involved, because um, that is extraordinarily important. Um, uh, Antonis, I, I thought uh, his point about how growing Turkish strength um, is today has, uh, has Washington alarmed. And then I think you tied that to the, the Kurdish um, question in, in Turkey. And this reminded me today of how there is absolute, I think, a widely shared uh, conviction throughout Turkish society that the outside powers, today the United States being the greatest one in particular, always want to use Turkey's internal problems as a way to keep it weak. And this brings me back to um, the uh, World War I period and the period right before. There was a um, report in 1916 that Talat Pasha, then the uh, Interior Ministry, he commissioned a report by the Foreign Ministry to look at the Armenian question uh, in international relations, that is, between the Ottoman Empire and relations with the great powers. And the report concluded that all of the great powers, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Russians and the British, have always used the Armenians against uh, us as a wedge to our empire. But also the report point, so did the Germans, so did the Italians, so did the Austrians. So there's this conviction among the Ottomans, all the great, this is really, it's just the front, is this issue. issue. They're, they're extraordinarily disingenuous again uh, in using it against them. One reason why uh, they are convinced of this is that, you know, as Ron mentioned, in 1914, 
You have in February the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire um, with uh, other uh, outside powers looking on after negotiations that go back and forth for about a year agree to overhaul the administration of Eastern Anatolia and to bring in outside uh, European uh, governors who will then be uh, handling the administration of Eastern Anatolia. At the same time, throughout this period, throughout 1913 and up until this uh, treaty is signed, and then thereafter, the, the situation is you have Russia putting pressure upon the Ottomans. You've got to increase uh, security in Eastern Anatolia. There is, there's too much chaos there. We don't want it spilling over our borders. And if you don't do it, we will intervene. So that seems fine. This seems where you have positive uh, third party intervention. There is a problem here. Uh, Armenians, in particular, are exposed uh, to raids. They aren't protected by uh, the Ottoman administration. Um, the Ottoman administration, in some cases, seems to be winking at uh, these attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Yet at the same time, and this is where the Kurdish uh, question comes back in, the Ottomans know very well, as do the other great powers, the British and the Germans uh, and the French, know that the Russians are at the same time working with Kurdish rebels and encouraging them to carry out attacks inside the Ottoman Empire. That is, you have at the same time the Russians are banging the table, telling the Ottomans to better institute reforms and make better and secure this region, yet under the table they're also, it looks like they're doing their best to destabilize it. Um, now there's this, it's not purely this company, are the Russians really playing a double game here? They are. Are they doing it intentionally? Maybe not, because the Russian concern is if we don't start cultivating support among the Kurds, what happens if the Ottoman Empire collapses, as looks more and more likely at the end of the, uh, at the, Bal the Balkan Wars, actually not so much collapses, but will be torn apart by outside powers. We might be faced with either what we today we would call a failed state, um, which will be, become a base essentially for terrorism and subversion against our empire, and worse again, that this might come under German and, and, and French and British influence. And so, the, but the Ottomans, to their perspective, this is all being engineered by the outside powers. On the one hand, they demand institute reform to protect Armenians, yet at the same time that they're telling us to do this, they are destabilizing the situation by uh, stoking the conflict between uh, the tribes um, and the Armenians. Um, I, I could go on and make some other points about Armenian agency. I don't know if I should I, uh, do I have time to do that or should well, I? Let's, let's get just quick responses to the questions mm -hmm. and then uh, we can go to because this was this my thinking on this was sparked by the question of your question, Sarah. Yes, uh, your, your question regarding um, the impact of, uh, of the conflicts. Has intervention changed in relation to the dynamics on the ground? How has that changed uh, intervention, or is it pretty much just always the same thing? Um, and the question you have wartime and peacetime. And what strikes me when looking at the history of Eastern Anatolia, there really isn't that great a differentiate. There's always a conflict going on there, and that's one of the problems. That this it's a simmering kind of almost low-level warfare is too strong a term. Um, but on the, by the summer of 19, so this is throughout the 1890s and then um, the beginning of the 20th century up until World War I. And on the eve of World War I, on both sides of the border, before formal, uh, formal declaration of hostilities or the, the attacks are carried out, you find increasing tensions on both sides. So you have cross-border raids being made. You have um, you know, pogroms carried out against um, Armenians uh, in the uh, Ottoman side. You have on the Iranian side that's occupied by Russia and in the Caucasus, you have attacks on Muslims, confiscation of property, et cetera. Uh, before the war actually is broken out, so you have this building up of hostilities. And so you see a market increase in 1914, but also <coughs> in 1913, 1912, 1911, there is, um, there's always a steady, there's a, there's a covert struggle going. It's covert and not so covert. Covert on the side of the great powers and not so covert on the part of the local actors who are all of them very concerned. They all know that the, or believe that the future of this region is going to be determined by the outside powers. So how do we adjust ourselves to that? And this, I guess, comes to the question of Armenian agency. Really, they are in a very difficult position because it's not possible to just sit I mean, this you know, the, the Turkish response um, uh, that sort of, well, the Armenians brought it on themselves. They made the choice to collaborate with the Russians, and they got what they deserved. Um, I mean, that, that's, uh, for a number of obvious reasons, it's quite, you know, really quite an offensive thing to say. And when you look more closely, the two things you find are one, I mean, in my estimation, one, they, they don't have really very many, they have no good options, number one. 
Number two, what I was struck by is the collaboration, many of them, well most I think were quite hesitant about collaboration, and many opposed it, it's, um, according to the sources that I've read, um, and these are Russian sources who are following very closely to Dostoevsky's tune, on the eve of this reform uh, program in 1914, in, in, in February 1914, which looks odd, this is a triumph for the Armenians because now they have, the, the great powers in Russia in particular have forced the Ottomans to overhaul the administration in Eastern Anatolia and to put that administration under the control of uh, Europeans, which looks like we've seen the same pattern in the Balkans. This was conducted and the Ottomans lost those territories and the Ottomans are convinced this is a new Macedonia we're going to lose this too. That is, the great powers go and they stoke conflicts, then they put in their own administrators, and then they take it from us. The Dash, a significant group of the Dashnak Sechun did not want to go along with, they opposed this reform program. Why? Because as if this is going to lead, they were one of the few groups that with the CUP and opposing this because both CUP fearing this, we're going to lose this territory for good to the Russians, as did the Dashnak Sechun. And I don't know, there was somebody, uh, this, well, I don't know if it's you, Gerard, but in, uh, someone can uh, tell me where this came from, but the problem for the Armenians was that the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman state, was too weak because they couldn't control what was going on in Eastern Anatolia. I could go into details of why that is. They couldn't get um, a handle on it. The Russian state was too strong. That is, the Arme Ottoman Armenians in Eastern Anatolia were exposed to raiding. Um, they were exploited. And... <clears throat> They could not, it was impossible, it's too much to demand that they sit there and simply uh, take their lot. On the other hand though, there was a fear among many of the revolutionaries that this territory is also now dominated by the Russians, they're going to essentially uh, snuff us out. Um, and so you have in fact, in 1914, a real split among the revolutionaries, who many of them really are, are very wary of this territory, of greater Russian influence in this territory. Thanks, Mark. Mm. Um, I'll begin with uh, Andranik's question about... Uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, hold on. Uh, the boss says we should start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, this is the last technical... Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So I'll begin with uh, an issue that Andranik raised uh, with regard to intervention sometimes being necessary and good. Uh, I don't think there's any disagreement between us. Uh, I, I just framed my comments initially using the school of thought that interventions are always good as the fourth right? And argued that interventions are not always good, which means, which does not mean that they are always bad. My central claim is that the relationship is not one kind. In other words, interventions can have either uh, the good outcome or the bad. Now, the good and bad in this case is also learned. Right. What do we mean by that? Sometimes the common uh, convention discourse on intervention assumes that it's some, based on some kind of shared norm and uh, an obvious matrix of, of, of measurement. But you're also absolutely right that it is, it is not based on anything like that. It's simply looking at it from the perspective of particular minorities. Right? Some minorities get lucky, others don't. And finally, the, the whole point of that that uh, ex ante, you don't know. Or not that you don't know, but there are systematic uncertainties that affect your assessments and your perceptions as to how you should act and how you should respond to the possible intervention of a third party, both from the perspective of the state and from the perspective of the minority. So I don't think there is uh, anything particularly um, uh, different in, in what I said. Sometimes it can be good and Armenians are unlucky. And indeed, I mentioned that the Armenian assessment, the Armenian revolutionary assessment, uh, it's not entirely crazy to think that we may, we may actually be among the lucky ones. It was based on prior experience of the Greeks, the Bulgarians, and the Serbs having gained their independence with significant third party support. So uh, you know, that, that, I suppose that we need some clarification. Now, with regard to the monotonicity thing, I also want to tie this to the question that Sarah asked and to the evidence that you mentioned about Bosniaks and the Kosovars. I absolutely agree with you that, uh, especially with the Kosovars, the end result seems to be completely to their advantage. Now, was it obvious from the very beginning, however, 
and whether the costs that were paid in the process of getting to where the Kosovars are were justified, and uh, whether uh, some of the costs could have been avoided had the third party behaved differently. But with Bosnians, uh, you know, it's, it's, even, it's even more difficult to argue that the Bosnian cases worked out completely to their liking because Bosnia is de, fa de facto partition, right? Uh, in fact, I'll tell you something else. Bosnia has now exactly the situation, politically and legally, that was being negotiated in 1991-1992 before Americans prematurely re recognized Bosnia's independence and precipitated the horrible war. So they, they fought a war. They had several tens of thousands of people killed to have pretty much what they would have had with the Cotillero plant in 1992. Had uh, Izet Begovic not pulled out of the negotiations uh, at the incitement of, of Zeman. So you know, there, there, it's, it's really uh, important not to lose sight that intervention is a more protracted and prolonged process. And we should not simply look at it from the perspective of, OK, the mass killing stops, let's say, or there are a series of massacres. Do the third parties act or not? And that is the only relevant part about third party behavior, which actually is one of my criticisms as an anthropology book. Nothing that happened, the, the entire politics beforehand is completely bracketed out, and you can't do that. The politics that uh, precedes the event is, is very, very important. Uh, Ron's argument about construction. I'm going to reveal something that I'm not going to use euphemisms. Ron and I belong to completely different paradigms in political science. I'm a hard-nosed, unapologetic, retrograde materialist. Ron is an idealist. And he's the Marxist among us, which is which is what makes it really fun. So, uh, <coughs> and this is neo what, Marxist, huh? neo Marxist, neo Marxist, <laughs> yes, the, the fake Marxist, <laughs> not the kind that I like, not the vulgar Marxist. That's right. Yeah, I like the vulgar Mar Marxist. Um, the, the the whole business of construction. Now, what does it mean to say those threats and perceptions were socially constructed? It's a, it's a, it's a, and, and again, I'm not going to choose words carefully, so forgive me <coughs> if they sound uh, a little aggressive. They don't, they're not meant to. This, to me, sounds like a description masking as an explanation. Of course, they were constructed in some way, but why were they constructed in this particular way and not in some other way, right? Well, that's the first question. The second question is, did they have anything to do with the material environment you yourself mentioned a lot of things in the material environment that made the Ottoman perceptions, if not rational, at the very least justified on the basis of the existing external material evidence. Right. So you cannot really rule that out. Does this mean that it was predetermined and it was the only possible conclusion to draw? Or that uh, the material events and circumstances could not have conspired in any other way or produced something else? No, I'm not making a theological argument. I'm not making an argument that the Armenian genocide was predetermined. But whether the acts that precipitated the genocide, or the acts that were responsible for the genocide and the perceptions that led to them were completely irrational and uh, completely unrelated to material circumstances, there I think we part ways and we have a serious disagreement. I think there was quite a bit of um, you know, material uh, reasoning behind it, and, uh, and indeed I think uh, some of their arguments uh, were, not, were not irrational. Now, the rationality of beliefs itself is an enormously complicated uh, subject. You know, some beliefs are obviously rational, and some beliefs are obviously irrational. Unfortunately, most of the interesting stuff is in between. And we, we, I agree with you there, probably that we can have a meeting point where uh, in that uh, we don't have good methods of determining what is rational and irrational beyond its obvious uh, cases of human history. Now, again, I can <coughs> go on for very long, but I'm going to answer one, one last thing which Milena brought up and which struck me as something very important and interesting. You're absolutely right, and this is also evidence uh, 
corroborating what I was saying about the insulation of elites. Diaspora behavior, the Armenian diaspora's behavior on the Armenian Turkish question, on the behavior of independent Armenia, particularly with regard to Turkey, but also with regard to Karabakh, is exactly, exactly a demonstration that when people don't have to bear the costs of certain policies, they are much more radical. What also corroborates my argument is that this is not only true in the Armenian case. Uh, the Jewish diaspora, and I don't mean the Jews as a community as a whole, but the engaged, organized Jewish community in this country is also tends to be much more radical and right-wing than uh, the average citizen of Israel. Right? And in fact, I think the Jewish diaspora, the organized Jewish diaspora in this country bears responsibility for shifting the Israeli politics so far to the right. And if, why, is that, why, why is that happening? Precisely because they are solving some other problem, really. Not only or not necessarily Israel's problem, but the problem of Israeli citizen security. And the same is true for people sitting in Los Angeles navigating war with Turkey while their sons are going to go to law school, not to the army. Uh, thanks, Arman. I am going to make some quick comments on a number of issues. But first, I'd like to repose the question, and maybe Michael can get back to this with regard to that economic issue. Yes, yes. Can we uh, reconcile these two different perceptions? Uh, very quick series of comments. Uh, Michael's talk on the Kurds and the importance of the Kurds raises a question which was done indirectly, uh, and that is, when we, we have a new uh, intervention, particularly humanitarian intervention, we have a, a minority. What you're arguing is that, in fact, there's more than one minority. And then it's a completely different game. That also leads me to think of uh, the question Sarah <coughs> asked and others implied, that is, uh, when is it that we call it intervention, when is it we call it an integral part of the problem? So that the intervention uh, is, is uh, just part of the process of the politics of a region of a problem, as opposed to Kosovo where you are out by and large, and you parachute in and then ostensibly you get out, but then with regard to Kosovo, which may be the case, my question is, was Kosovo a good outcome? Was it a good outcome for the Kosovars? Maybe, but was it a good outcome for the international order? Because Kosovo produced some of the Abkhazia, and it may have made Garapal much harder, because Garapal leaders are saying, look, that was impossible, now it's possible. So in terms of our assessment, we have to think a little wider. Uh, when I bring up the question of Armenian agency parties, the patriarchate, etc. Uh, I uh, certainly don't have in mind the idea of uh, blaming Armenians for the victimization. That is, nothing justifies genocide. There, there's nothing. I mean, a baby may be crying and keeping me awake, but I don't throw out the baby from the window, which would solve the problem, but then nothing justifies that. So that's not the issue. The issue is to bring out the complexity. The issue is to bring out a lot of the um, uh, issues uh, that have not been dealt with that is, uh, there's an agency in the other way. That is, uh, this is an argument David Rosan gave in 95. Uh, I don't know if anyone, if you were there, on the 80th anniversary uh, genocide conference in Yerevan. And he was arguing that there's responsibility of the political parties, and the responsibility was in the fact that they did not see what was coming. They contributed to the draft. They did not organize enough resistance, and they didn't fight the Turks to save more lives. That was his, that's a very different kind of agency. Could they have seen what was coming? Well, the Tashnaks uh, had an interest in really, uh, they had invested too much, let's say, in their cooperation with the young Turks to pull out. Uh, but many of them were concerned. The Henshaks, in 1913, there's a Henshak editorial that says, look at what these young, uh, the CUP is doing. And if this continues like this, things will happen to us compared to which the 94, 95, 6 massacres are child's game. They said, 
bigger calamity will come. So there is a, the ability to predict. Uh, so it's the options which are very important. Brown mentions and how how many options? How why were the options uh, so few and got less and less? In terms of the intervention, again, the promise of intervention and in action on the promise are probably the most dangerous. That is, if you have promised to intervene and you don't, non-intervention becomes very serious. So th there's uh, a, another twist we have. Or you, uh, or you can intervene in the half Yeah. So basically, yeah. So Expected American intervention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gates for Gates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cheney had said you can expect. Uh, okay. Uh, Andranik made a point about non inter uh, about uh, uh, the third party intervention being necessary for all the goals that have been set. You know, uh, territory from Turkey, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maybe it's the goals that must be adjusted. You know. And even and who's going to be that third party that will, that's going to give you territory from Turkey? Russia is a sponsor of the protocols which recognizes, which recognize the current borders. Russia, the Soviet Union have never promised them, never. So and and the Soviet Union renewed treaties. No, no, uh, well, that was a small <coughs> game. That was a game we can't take. It. Russia, as a as a separate country now has consistently uh, signed treaties that recognize the border. So that, that there's no strategy, the real strategy, that can do something. So I'm very concerned about uh, the uh, idea that uh, uh, that we, we should really focus on, on that as a value. Um, you, uh, the, uh, on the protocols themselves, I think that this would be my brief interpretation. The two countries realize uh, their long-term strategic interests in normalizing and opening borders. That is the goal of the protocols. Both countries have something else, secondary issues they are concerned about. Um, Turkey has two issues. Armenia has no preconditions. Turkey has the issue of uh, the campaign for genocide recognition. And, uh, Army, uh, and it has the issue of the linkage with Garapa, which starts in 93. It does not start in 91. Uh, in 93, after Armenian forces take Kalbajar, then the Turks say, this is too much. Okay. Now we have two issues. And they bring up these issues because Armenia is in a weak position diplomatically. Then they split the difference. That is, the Armenian side concedes a subcommission that will look at history which is a concession to Turkey. The Turkish side agrees not to have uh, the uh, Garapan issue brought up in the protocol directly, but there are enough principles there enunciated that will, that if I was a Turkish diplomat, I'd say this means Garapan, if you don't understand it, fellows. There's enough of the principles of non-intervention in the terms of other states that would refer indirectly to Garapan. So, uh, Armenia gets what? Armenia gets the official deal linkage. Turkey gets the official uh, historical subcommission. So it's a split. Now, governments split such differences in their treaties. The problem is that both countries, despite their experience, each one believed that they got a victory. Each one <laughs> believed that the other is going, the other side is going to behave as if they believed in what they said. That is, for the Armenian government to believe that Turkey really delinked, and it was going to keep it delinked, was delusionary. There's no way Turkey could have delinked. On paper, they did under pressure. But you see all the statements before signing, initializing, after signing, that that is not possible. And it, it is something that was predicted to me. At least I have written constantly that Turkey cannot deal in for different reasons. In the protocols, it's not there. But for the Armenian government to believe that they, they succeeded in doing so, and Turkey will now behave as if it's dealing. For the Turkish government that has followed genocide recognition campaign for 40 years, to believe that because now there's a 
subcommission for the general, for, for historical, to find the historical truth thing. That, that is the end of the Armenian campaign. And then to be shocked that this campaign continues. For them to believe that's delusionary. And this is where what happens is each side is uh, functioning under an illusion, at least publicly. And that illusion, uh, those two illusions, are making impossible the larger goal of the strategic goal of normalizing relations. And in terms of Armenian goals, if, the, if, if there's a question of Turkish Armenian rapprochement and the protocols are going to create something that is good, and that intervention of the third parties, the third parties have messed up this. The only thing that has so far benefited is the real work that was done within uh, Turkey since the, the, uh, the change of government and since the independence of Armenia and the policy of not making genocide part of the US uh, Armenia's foreign policy. That has done much more for Tur changes in the Turkish position on, on the genocide. And the uh, campaigns for recognition of the genocide and third party intervention, that is Washington, deciding that it will exchange the, the dilemma that Obama has and others have uh, with this protocol, it has made things much worse. That is, when Erdogan started, he made some statements that questioned the policy of denial that Turkey had. As these things have gone on, Erdogan has now become the chief champion of denial. And I think that's a regression in the overall uh, uh, promotion. So we can take specific things and say the protocols were signed. That's a, that's a major step. But at the same time, we are in a worse situation now in terms of the international situation than we were uh, before. Um, one final comment, and that is on uh, uh, what Ron said about Russia's role in the region. I think I fully agree with you. I think what will happen is uh, that eventually the United States will concede uh, the position of chief mediator to Russia as long as there's a promise that fundamental American interests will not be harmed by a solution which Russia can impose. Because the US cannot impose, Russia can impose. And the big recalcitrant party is the Armenian party. And the Russians are the only one who can, who can push. Russia may be weak, but they're weak compared to the US. They're not weak compared right. to the region. And this is something Azerbaijan understood a little late, and Georgia understood at a, at a great cost. So. Uh, uh, the, the question is here uh, that whether that Russian intervention can be seen as positive. The question is Russia is integral, the integral problem, a part of the problem. So I wouldn't call it, uh, analyze it under intervention. I wouldn't call it under third party. If they are a party to the conflict, just as the US is, it, it really doesn't fall under, uh, you know, under that uh, uh, definition. I'm planning. Almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, Arna that we didn't have serious uh, conflict of opinion, but I just wanted to mention that uh, you, you over, just you <coughs> overestimated or over focused on this exacerbances and the uh, third party more damaging. That's why I try to balance in a way that sometimes you have to look at the global interest, strategic interest of the third party rather than this uh, minorities. Nobody cares about these minorities. I remember, uh, I am member of Scientific Council of Russian Foreign Ministers. I beloved with my classmate. The year, uh, the year before, every year, 27th or 29th of December, we are getting together in the reception house of foreign minister eh, to, to summarize foreign policy of the year and give some recommendations. Some people are coming from our Is academy. that an annual process? Yes, annual, yeah. yeah. Rimanko, the yeah. director of Rimanko, some other. Yeah, and I remember, when Primakov raised the problem, 
to listen. I said, very soon Americans are going to recognize Kosovo. What's going to be our reaction? And opinion is political. I said, of course, we have to go forward and recognize our Russia and Abkhazia. Because now we know who's responsible. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because he, I said, you can't say that there is no basic difference between these cases. You said that. I said, Sergey, you said that. Putin said that. And after that, if you are not going forward, you are uh, damaging your reputation. Uh, why the hell you are talking that much? You just uh, shut up. But at that time, by the way, they were not ready for that. And he said, no, we what never said this. We, what that is? was December 29, uh, 2007. 2007, December. December. And they were not <coughs> ready to recognize. They didn't want to do that. And this became clear even when Americans recognized and most which Russia did, because Russia didn't want to harm its relations with the US. Russia was reluctant. But what did Saakashvili? He did exactly what I wrote a couple of years before that, after Beslan. I had an article in Izvestia. The title was Saakashvili, Dabivayats and Nizavisimosti Yurme Asetti i Abkhazi. Saakashvili is doing his best to make South Ossetia and Abkhazia independent. I gave this kind of a bit, you know, uh, ridiculing Saakashvili, but he really happened to do that. <laughs> if not the invasion, Russia never recognized. Russia valued much more relations with the US and Europe in other direction. That's why he didn't want to increase the tension. Really, the, I'm just trying to show that big powers, sometimes they have their uh, interests and they don't, and I realized during the discussion many times, being in presidential council and other places, nobody cares about this minority. If I'm trying to create a quick question. Is there any chance Russia may withdraw its recognition and find no, 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 no. Uh, that's why I had with Nixon Center recently in December a seminar on South on frozen conflicts. And the only thing which I told to American State Department participants uh, from White House, from other places, forget about South Ossetia and that part. Just forget it. It's finished. And you know, the war is in, they said, Oh, nobody is recognizing only Nicaragua or a couple of, I don't know. Nobody, nobody cares about that because if you have a great power permanent, uh, having a permanent seat on Security Council, you don't need other recognition. You don't need that. And you have all this population having their uh, Russian passport. The only problem, the only loser of all this is the president and foreign minister. They are not allowed now to travel <laughs> having their passports of Abkhazia or Assisi. This is Which the funniest. Baga, Baga, Abkhaz president and South Ossetian president, they can't travel because nobody recognizes. If you don't recognize, you don't recognize his passport. Initially, they traveled by Russian passport and no problem. Karabakh president is coming here, no problem. It's not recognized, but he has Armenian blood. These guys now, they travel to Paris, they travel everywhere. And now they can travel anywhere. Except Russia. Except Russia and the countries which recognize them. They can't even use going to these countries. They can use even Russian passport because they are well known president. What is your what is your profession or what is your position? The president of the country. <laughs> I work as president. <laughs> this, this is the funniest. Okay. But I, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, I don't agree. I, I agree in a greater uh, degree what you said about this, this uh, rule. 
the delusion uh, on both sides that they did one thing, but they meant something uh, else. But again, for me, it's a mystic. I don't understand. It's a very clear victory of Armenian diplomacy, at least on the surface. It's very clear victory. Turks agreed to sign protocols without preconditions and in a reasonable time frame. It's unbelievable. It doesn't matter that they had in their mind Karabakh all the time. I met Matthew Breiser in uh, Washington in December when Erdogan and David Oblu were there, and he was waiting uh, for his assignment as an ambassador to Azerbaijan. Now I think it's finished, but at that time he was still waiting. And after the meeting with David Oglu and Erdogan, after the meeting, their meeting with Obama, he came to uh, dinner and said, listen, I'm running. Now, they are not telling that give back the territories, do this, do that. The only thing which now they, they are insisting on is as a kind of face saving, some progress in Karabakh issue some progress in Azri armenian relations. I said, what, what, what does it mean, some progress? He said, any progress, some progress. <laughs> this is the position of the State Department. But nobody can tell them that because Armenians are not going to compromise on anything in Karabakh because you, you just don't have anything to compromise. Anyway, that's why, again, I must tell you that this really was this is a mistake for me. The Turkish agreement on this uh, protocol, this is a kind of, uh, I can't understand, I can't explain how they did that. All right. John, do you want to make some comments? Just a small one. Uh, Mark, um, I, I think this question that Armand raised about constructivism versus what we'll call positivism or materialism versus idealism is not, is not simply an esoteric or academic uh, question. It's actually, extraordinarily important about the way we understand the world. Uh, and the worst thing to do would be to characterize your opponents of position, which I won't do, but you don't want to oversimplify what they're saying because no constructivist is saying that these constructions, these imagined uh, situations are made out of thin air. They are made out of, out of experience uh, and they are influenced by material and structural uh, elements as well. So no one is denying that. What, they, what constructivists argue is that structures and material things in themselves don't determine very much. They are always mediated through the way people understand things. That is, we don't act necessarily uh, on the fact that we are working in a factory. We act on the fact that we work in a factory and we have certain ideas about and feelings and understandings of working in that. People act out of their perceptions, their understandings, their beliefs, their values, and their emotional concerns. So the situation could be structurally given, but different actors will understand it in different ways. And then you know this famous question of Thomas Frank, what's wrong with Kansas? Uh, people in Kansas vote against their material interests. They vote for the Republicans, uh, and they're all upset about gay rights. There aren't there are like six gay people in Kansas. <laughs> Right, all in the closet, okay. and they still act on this because, they, and they don't act on the fact that, that the Bush administration has given all this uh, tax breaks to the rich, because they have other kinds of understandings and other concerns. That's what's important. So what we're interested in is how people are acting. Why young Turks decide at a certain point they can no longer compromise, they can no longer negotiate with Armenians, they have to annihilate them. That's a very particular and a very peculiar thing. Now, if you take the old Armenian view, you didn't have to explain this. Because, I mean, I remember asking, I won't mention his name, very prominent Armenian historian, why did the Turks do this? And he's saying to me, well, you're trying to explain this, you're rationalizing. I said, well, why did they do this? And he had no answer, but the assumption is, that's what Turks are. They're Armenian killers. <laughs> they just do that. It's in their racial makeup, it's in their culture, something of the sort. But for five centuries, they didn't do it. There was no genocide until this last moment. So there's really less <coughs> disagreement between us than you think at one level in that we take structural and material situations into account. It's very important, but we're most concerned with how people understand them, how they feel about them. 
And that's on the basis of their values, their moralities, their beliefs that they act. Which then brings us to the last, so in other words, Marx himself was not a vulgar Marxist. He did not believe in an unmediated uh, determination of material or structural conditions, but rather how people, in fact, evaluate them without neglecting those material and structural conditions. Did you Marx? Yes, yeah, I'm a revisionist. No, I'm, I'm a Marxist, uh, but the real Marxist, and not Soviet Marxist or vulgar Marxist or whatever. And secondly, this question of rationality, irrationality, that, that Jira and I have gone around as well. There's a sense in which the Young Turks, given what they did, acted rationally. Adolf Hitler acted rationally in murdering the Jews. But he acted rationally within that discursive universe and that emotional disposition which said, Jews are a virus. They are an existential threat to the survival of the Aryan race. If you accept those premises, then murdering six million people was perfectly, as well as, by the way, communists, homosexuals, retarded people, mentally defective, because you're, you had this idea, this fantasy about about what was good for Germany, which was, of course, irrational at that end, but rational within the system. Irrational yes, in Yes, and, and that's exactly what the Young Turks were doing. They had constructed and imagined an Armenian threat. You know, you could say it's a real threat, it's not a real threat. It was their threat. And within that, they decided to take this action, homogenize uh, the, the demography of, of Anatolia, and survive. They did a horrible, terrible thing that has no justification whatsoever. They were pathological in their understandings. That's how people act. And I end my talks with, on the genocide always with the same things. The Turks did monstrous things, but they aren't monsters. They're only too human. And other governments, including democratic governments like the United States, did similar things in Vietnam and now in Iraq. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people died in those wars unnecessarily because of what the Americans thought was necessary for them and their values and capitalism and democracy of their sort to survive. Thanks. Now, let's uh, see if we can I make a small uh, remark on this issue because it's interesting. Uh, during our talk meetings, we had a guy, uh, uh, Bonnie Bolton, might be you heard the name. Of this the guy. Guy. This guy. Okay. But the guy said, and I was amazed, we were thinking that Armenians are the stealing of victims, they were victimized. And the guy presented us the picture of Turks being victimized all the time. And he called us to have empathy toward the Turks <laughs> because they were losing their lives, they were losing their lives. All these people, they, 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 yeah. And uh, I was amazed at this, this kind of interpretation that and Europeans always treated them as, you know, something alien, uh, something uh, hostile, something, you know, inferior. 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 And this was their, their vision how, and he, he said, when in Cyprus, this analysis, Happened. He's from Cyprus. He said, "This is guy, a professor in American University for many years. This Virginia University of Virginia in Charlotte." He said, "I jumped the car. I drove the car from Vienna or from somewhere, and all the way my peers crying that the last, the, the last part of Turkey, Cyprus, is going. You know, can you? This, this, the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire. And the last thing we met." Two Turks, one, a short time former foreign minister, Susail. I don't remember where, I don't know what so yeah. so so A short time foreign minister, and another guy, the, the head of institute on Armenian, Emin or something. They told me, they told us in, uh, in Istanbul, very clearly, very seriously, very rationally, I'm just trying to prove what you said. They said, we are sleeping. And sometimes, in our dreams, we see the map of Turkey divided uh, according to several treaty. Uh, we were amazed, you know, this is, this is the perception of this kind of guys. One small addition. Not only Turkey, but Russia has a similar. You can even, you can talk about the sort of collective uh, effective disposition of Russians. 
Russians think of themselves as victims, as humiliated, as un disrespected by the United States. And now that may be in part created, but if you read Putin's Munich speech or whatever, all of those things are part of their mentality. It may be instrumental. It may be a way they're using that to affect policy, but it may also be internalized. Thank you. Uh, no, about Munich's speech, I wrote an article and the title is very good uh, for, for you. Uh, Putin committed a mortal sin. He told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can tell the truth. <laughs> okay. I'm not a very question or comment. Uh, these are a comment from both the question for you. Um, what Professor Singh said, but then um, I initially agreed to, to, to your reaction because I was oh. thinking, okay, <laughs> there should be a rational thinking. Now, but uh, then you changed your mind after um, was coming? No, I didn't change, but I, I understand. Because I didn't have a response, but, but uh, and then my question is, um, that's the internal way of um, accepting the reality, like the affective disposition, but within the affective disposition or as a third party or as a third person, where do you distinguish within this disposition the reality and the fictional reality or whatever your emotion mm -hmm. is? Let's say you're a researcher and where is the limit of, the, of this reality and the emotion of very perception? Good. Very, very good question. And the problem is that methodologically it's extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, right? So mm -hmm. the positivists think they can know reality. <coughs> they are making what I would call an ontological error. And I'm saying that you have to think epistemologically, not ontologically. They're saying, I know what reality is. It's out there, without understanding that it's about perception. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying, and by the way, this goes back to Lenin and imperial criticism and it goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it goes way, way back. So what you do, so the real question is the methodological question. How do you determine? So you're trying to understand what their motivation is. And Atranik, in fact, gives you a clue. Sometimes they actually tell what they think, or they hint at what they think. And you can read statement after statement after statement of Talat Pasha, of Inder Pasha. You can go very easily to uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's memoirs. He was talking to these guys. And they, they talk about these things, resentment, fear, anxiety, uh, and so forth. So they actually are far, far more open about what they're actually thinking, right? They're justifying themselves, right? But in fact, this is their, their rationality, in a sense. So we don't have, you know, there's always the problem of how, whether discourse, in fact, corresponds to reality. But the only thing we can do as social scientists is understand that we can only get to discourse. We can mention those other factors, but that's the only thing you can really get to. But we understood that Armenians were trapped. This was not only perception. Mm. They were trapped. They were. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, any questions, comments? Did you want to add something? We have another question for uh, Arman. You mentioned one of the variables is how likely is the perpetrator to be punished. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this in comparative lens? Mm. In a comparative lens, like bringing other cases or examples? Or how likely well, was the, the perpetrator to be punished? The, the problem with minds. putting it in a comparative perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and here we run into a more interesting methodological problem, is that the ones that were concerned about being punished didn't commit genocide. Right? No. There were also ones that did commit and then got punished. Right. But the, the next methodological issue is whether that's why they got punished. For example, there is a myth that people who were hanged in Nuremberg were punished because of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was barely mentioned. Was put, I, I don't think it was even mentioned. Yet. They were punished for starting the war. Right? So uh, there are, I mean, the, the, the actual perpetrators of the Armenian genocide were put on trial in 1918, right? Or 1919. 1919. Yeah, by, so by the Ottoman government. And by the British. And by the uh, British. Under yeah. British. So before came out. Yeah. Uh, you do have cases of some human rights abusers having been punished. The problem is, again, uh, before the fact you don't know what will happen, both with regard to punishment, and punishment I don't, I don't only mean uh, 
uh, whether you know, the actual perpetrators like Bagasora in Rwanda would be ferried to the neighboring country and put in jail and, and, and put on trial. By punishment, I also mean when you escalate, right? And, and um, intervention is usually a process of gradual escalation. We also tend to think, you know, that, to think of it as a single shot act. But interventions, as I already uh, pointed out, they're pr protracted pr processes of action and counteraction. And at each rung of the ladder, you have to calculate let's say you're the perpetrator. When I escalate against the minority, is the intervener going to escalate the intervention in response? I'll give you the example of Milosevic's thinking when he uh, decided to escalate in Kosovo in response to the airstrike. He had concluded that Americans were not going to escalate. Was it rational or not? Now, Ron will tell me that you can't even ask that question. It's a stupid question to ask. Right? I don't think that. I don't. <laughs> well, uh, I can't. There's, your there's, mouth, there's as long rationality as within context. That's bound rationality. Well, I, I, I don't even know why is it why it is bounded rationality. Because when you look at the evidence that is available to Milosevic when he's making that decision, if I'm there, if a robot is sitting there, what evidence would that robot consider? Well, I'll give you some examples of what that robot would look like when making the decision to escalate or not, thinking whether Americans are going to escalate the intervention. Number one, right before the airstrikes, uh, American and British leaders have their, done their damnedest to convince their own publics and everybody else in Europe and in the United States that there will be no commitment of ground troops. Interesting piece of evidence, which, which is a signal of weak resolve, right? Unwillingness to escalate. Before that, they held a vote in the Congress with the proviso that there will be no uh, ground troops committee, and it barely passed. Still 200 and odd members, vote, sorry, 100 and odd members voted against the resolution. It was a very weak re resolution. It wasn't a popular war in the United States. Several months before that, Clinton and, and uh, Blair had bombed Iraq with a very clearly articulated demand, and they had defined what would constitute victory. The victory was for Saddam to allow the inspectors back into Iraq. Saddam said, go to hell. They bombed for a few weeks. And then Blair and Clinton uh, ran out of bombs or something. They gave a press conference and said, we have succeeded. And somebody asked, how the hell have you succeeded? And they said, we succeeded in considerably degrading Iraq's capabilities. And they declared victory. And Milosevic is looking at all of this, right? Now, what else would he consider when making that decision? When he's trying to figure out whether there will be punishment or not? I think this is the evidence. But what someone else, looking at the same evidence, might have found other evidence, might have found duplicity. After all, they did bomb That's right. Iraq. So it is possible that some other actor with an intellectually no, different no, disposition no, and psychologically different disposition might have concluded differently and might not have <coughs> taken chances. Would Shivarnadze have done the, what Saakashvili did? I can think no, of no, With well, the same evidence, he would not have I, done it. I, I can add another, uh, another uh, thing uh, as a practical thing because I was at that time advisor to Chernomerdri on Yugoslavia. Right exactly at that time, and even if I had problems with Igor Ivanov was for a minute, uh, Milosevic overlooked the important thing that Russia is going to side U.S. Uh, pressing on him just to surrender. My, well, my advice was I can remember, that you are going to resist and continue, and Russia's position is going to be to support him, and Americans to come and bring ground troops and they'll never do that, or even they'll do that, they're going to have a serious defeat worse than in Somalia, than in other places, and it's going to be a serious problem for Clinton. For, but what happened? He couldn't expect that Russia is going to give away. This was because uh, Cheshire, I, we have good friend. His elder brother was ambassador in Moscow, and we are hush eating hush together, oh, and he, he said, uh, 
they were sitting Ahtisari and Chernomerdin in his palace. I've been a couple of times, several times there. In, and Chernomerdin, not Ahtisari, said, if you are not going to accept the ultimatum, we are going to let to smash and destroy everything here, and Moscow is not going to even move a finger. This, this was the decisive, why that happened. Otherwise, Americans will have a serious failure over there if he continue and to go up to the end. Okay. Let me just finish. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is because there are some other issues. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't actually true to explain decision making and why I, I do think actually it was very rational. First of all, uh, I disagree that the uh, Russian uh, abandonment of negotiating was visible at the time that negotiating was That information is not available to negotiating. Secondly, and this is probably the most important thing about understanding closely, which nobody ever mentions. What were the terms of the ceasefire? Does anybody know? Well, the terms of the ceasefire were exactly those that were the, the that, well, except, well, the terms of the ceasefire involved the removal of the deal breakers at Rome. You go to Rambuia, you get an ultimatum, and you say these two coins are, are deal breakers. I'd rather be bombed than sign under those, right? Then they start bombing. And then uh, the terms of the ceasefire involve the removal exactly of these two points. How is this a defeat for Milosevic? Now, we can say, well, eventually they recognized Kosovo. At the time, that wasn't the game. What happened later is, is a different stage of the conflict and cannot necessarily affect our judgment of whether Milosevic is decision making at the time of Russia or not. Now, again, I agree. and, and I, here I'm going to repeat what you said, which is uh, the, the disagreement probably is sometimes apparent rather than real. And uh, there is indeterminacy indeed in uh, decision making under those circumstances. And different people, different actors make different decisions. And we have this unfalsifiable thing which you know, you know, our, our internationalists usually uh, resort to when they cannot solve this indeterminacy, which is risk preference. You know. And risk preferences are never verifiable externally, and they are only verifiable after the fact. So that issue raises all sorts of issues of unfalsifiability, et cetera. Uh, but, and, and this is the last thing I would say about this dispute, now, having said that there are indeterminacies, doesn't necessarily, and, and you know, under different circumstances, one actor behaves this way, the other behaves another way, doesn't necessarily prove that it's, uh, it's the, the affective dispositions that are uh, doing the, uh, the explanatory work. I can name you hundreds of other material variables that may solve these indeterminacies. The problem is that the, the debate has usually been structured between realist and constructivist and realist insist on unitary actor assumptions. You can have materialist theories that do not rely on unitary actors, and a lot of these indeterminacies can, can be solved out. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to give a couple of minutes. Uh, we have just three minutes left. A couple of minutes to see if you have anything to say. Yeah, yeah just uh, to get back to your, yeah. to your question on um, <laughs> how to describe the Armenian economic position. Maybe the, the more accurate thing to say might be that economic opportunity is opening up for some Armenians, and that's the emerging of these quasi industrial classes. Uh, to certainly describe the Armenians' uh, political condition was getting worse. Um, in, this is after the CUP comes to power and things begin. They improve briefly from 1908 to 1911, then they get worse again. If you go back more in history, the 1890s are a critical time when you have the first massacres before 1994 and And there is a great, there are a lot of Armenian land, including church land, is confiscated. And that becomes the base, the most, uh, the, 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 the basis of the, of the conflict or the most uh, sore point in the struggle when the CUP, after the CUP comes to power because the Armenians believe that the CUP. Uh, they, they say that this is our number one priority. We want to get the land back that was expropriated from us in the 1890s. The CUP is actually very um, uh, sympathetic to Armenian claims. But so many problems pop up. The, the, the war with Italy, the problems, and then, of course, the Balkan Wars. Um, 
and they are, and then they, they face tremendous uh, pushback from this, from the Kurdish populations um, in eastern Anatolia. And in order not, because they realize we can't, we don't have the resources in order to alienate them from us entirely. Um, so therefore, they back off the land reform. When they're out of power, then the government in power actually then the idea is well, we'll just buy land back from the landowners and redistribute it then uh, to the Armenians and solve it that way. So they uh, allocate, uh, I think, 100,000 was the Turkish, I forget the, 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 the monetary uh, unit. But then the Balkan Wars broke out. And then not only do they not have that money, they actually have to raise taxes in Eastern Anatolia, which then provokes a new cycle of uh, rebellions. Um, and uh, so the, 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 just to say, the conditions are, again, Armenians, you, there's often this portrayal of Armenians, they're a wealthy merchant class which is not the case in the Eastern Anatolia. The vast majority are peasants, and they're living in serfs. I mean, in some ways, worse than peasants. Um, they're tied to the land. But I should also point out that most of the, so you wouldn't, if you had, you wouldn't choose Eastern Anatolia as a place to be born, and you wouldn't want to be born as an Armenian peasant. Nor, however, would you want to be born as a Kurd. The uh, life expectancy for Kurds is in the early 30s. Um, the, and that's because the infant, mort infant mortality rates were tremendous. And rates of disease and blindness were extraordinary. Um, and this is one thing that, that uh, disturbed a lot of Kurds, because if they were continuing like this, at least the Armenians, it looks like they might be able to, we're all in a mess, but it looks like they might have a way out of this, whereas it works. Uh, that's a, it's a very important distinction. Yeah. OK. Um, it's 1 o'clock. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some. It's not the uh, same as what I would get to the Dallas in Moscow. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and the is it's not even <laughs> what I got for dinner in Ankara, yeah. but still, it's something we can eat. You are most welcome to join us. Ron has to leave to rush to the class. Uh, yeah. Oh, another, another seminar. Yeah. seminar. So thank you very much for to Anton and Michael for traveling for this. Uh, I do hope, and of course Ron and Arma, I do hope uh, that this is the beginning to, for all of us to think about these issues and see maybe we'll find a way to continue this as a forum to think as to how all of this changes, if it does anything we, uh, we say about uh, Armenian history and this Turkish Armenian. Thank you very much.